How's it doing? How's it going, everybody? This is Dave Meltzer. We're going to be here for two hours talking to pro wrestling. We've got Brian Alvarez, Figure Four Weekly here, and we were not going to have a guest today. Ken Shamrock is going to do the show next Tuesday, which we sort of hinted at yesterday, but that is confirmed, which is good because it's regarding just uh, various things, including last night's television. And uh, we why don't we? It's actually a lot of news to get to today as well. Uh, but we will start with last night's Raw show, Brian. Why don't you give your thoughts of that? I love the. Uh, I think you pretty much mentioned this last night at the website, but it was like the first hour and fifteen minutes of the show was like one long soap opera. And the thing that struck me was there were three matches in like the first hour, maybe first hour and fifteen minutes actually, because they did the Linda Vince thing, and two of them involved the Big Show. And that should tell you a lot about the uh, first half of that show. And I thought the Steve Regal. Uh, Chris Jericho, Chris Benoit match was pretty good from a storyline standpoint. The match really wasn't much because it was all about storyline. And I thought the main event was pretty damn good as well. And, you know, the Hardys, in the storyline, it was their big shot at the big time and they had to step it up. But in the ring, they pretty much did it in real life and stepped it up. And the big angle was Lita giving Stephanie the moonsault for the pinfall. And I got to tell you that before I even watched this match, I got an email. And it was from somebody asking if Lita was going to be challenging Steve Austin for the title. And as I'm watching the show, and they're setting this up backstage with Lita and Vince McMahon, and Vince signs the match, I suddenly just thought, oh my god, they're going to do a six-man, and Lita's going to pin Steve Austin. And I will (laughs) never, ever watch wrestling again. But it didn't happen. She pinned Stephanie. But anyway, then they destroyed her afterwards and laid her out, and just pretty much gave Lita a tremendous beating. And, uh... I don't know, maybe she will challenge Steve Austin for the title on SmackDown, but I doubt it. Um, I, I know what I watched. I thought that the final segment of the show was really good, and it was really about the only segment of the show I thought that was that good. I was like, the the thing, you know, the Austin-Jim Ross angle on Thursday was tremendous, and I wouldn't have minded if they had, like, you know, clipped it up into about a three-minute package, but to go on for, like, what was it, like 15 minutes... It was so too long watching that thing again. I mean, I just couldn't keep my interest. And then, you know, it was also you just watch Vince and his facial expressions while he watched it back on TV. Yeah, but I mean, they could they could show clips of it, and Vince could still make the same facial expressions. We could save twelve minutes. Yeah, but I don't know. And they didn't of show all, all the of segments, it. I didn't mind that one as much as some of the others they could have done because I thought it really? was a hell of a segment. Oh, I loved the segment the first time. I just didn't really want... I mean, this, this is the total example, though, of... Um, they would have never done that um, two weeks ago. I mean, they would never oh, yeah. do a repeat for 15 minutes. I mean, it's a totally different... The last two weeks of Raw, you can see a totally different mentality um, in that they're, they're not afraid of losing viewers. Um, and they will, you know, they'll do things a lot longer and do a lot less wrestling on the show, as obviously is, was the case as well. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the, Lin- the Linda segment... Um, you know, you know, there's something about. I guess I shouldn't like try to like bring any reality into that because there's no, you know, there's no reality in, in this. But to me, okay, the character of Mr. McMahon, all right, and then forget about real life Vince and Linda McMahon. I don't, this is, has nothing to do with that. This is just character. Okay, the character of Mr. McMahon is someone. You know, it's like Linda McMahon is portrayed as this wonderful person. Okay. Mm-hmm. But you know what? If you're so wonderful, um, it, I, why would you be married to this guy except for the money? And then, and then how wonderful can I find this woman? And 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 you know all these great qualities. If she's been married to this guy for 34 years, for 34 even though, I guess, years, as they uh, keep saying. You know, I mean, okay, up until the, uh, the the fallout of the Survivor Series, I mean, the TV announcer character of Vince McMahon really didn't have any repugnant qualities other than you know he's a TV announcer. But certainly. Um, the television character, Mr. McMahon, since 1998, has, has not been someone that, you know, you would, you know, that a great person who stands up for herself would want to be married to. Well, that's why so, she wants a divorce. Okay, after three years, she wants a divorce after being blatantly cheated on on, on television. Now she after wants a divorce. After being made up, ill. After being drugged. Line. You and made drugged me up, ill. And drugged up. And all yeah. this. I mean, it's like, Kept against it's like I'm watching... I'm watching, like, the writers from Dallas from 20 years ago, you know, with uh, Sue Ellen Ewing. But Sue Ellen Ewing, you know, because J.R., obviously, obviously, um, Vince McMahon's well, character is, to- is totally based on... I don't. Did you ever see that show? You were probably too young to watch that show, did you? Actually, I used to spend the night at my grandma's house all the time, and she would always be watching Dallas. So, I didn't really watch much of the show, but I knew J.R. and all those guys. Okay, because, you know, the Vince McMahon character is totally based on J.R. Ewing. I mean, I see, you know, the similarities are incredible. 
Um, Actually, I used to say that before he did his character, too, but that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> that used to be what we said in the 80s. But um, anyway, um, yeah, so, so, but Sue Ellen Ewing, for most of that period, who, who kind of played the similar role as Linda McMahon, was certainly, I mean, she was portrayed as a very weak woman, you know, alcohol problem. Later in the show, I mean, they sort of baby-faced her a little bit. But that was, when they baby-faced her, she really did divorce him. Well, anyway... So if Linda's going to do a storyline divorce, okay, that's one thing. But, okay, how is Linda and Vince going to get back together at the end unless Vince turns babyface or she is so weak that she falls for his swerve like, you know, like Deborah did a couple of weeks ago? Yeah. I don't know. It's it's kind of digging a hole right now. It's like one of those things where, you know, Vince has this thing in mind, well... Now we'll do the divorce and I'll have to grovel for a while. But he's not actually thinking, okay, three months down the road, what's going to happen? Are we going to divorce? She gets half the money and goes to WCW? Then what? Yeah. I think well, it was somebody, 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 had, somebody had a really funny letter. Um, in fact, uh, I'm trying to, I, I, I should try to get it in just a second. But, but basically, the, the idea is that they split the assets. Like Vince gets the... Vince gets the XFL, WCW, and all of the, uh, and on all the videotape library of the WBF. That's a fair split. <laughs> but anyway, the, um, well, um, as far as the, the final segment of the show with the beating of Lita, you know, when I watched it, it was like, you know, I thought it was great heel heat, you know, um, you know, the way they did it, the way she laid on Matt to save Matt, and then they, instead of like, you know, then they just beat the hell out of her, both Hunter and, and especially Steve Austin. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, so as a fan, I liked it, but then someone wrote me a letter and brought up the uh, Tiffany Unit case. And all of a sudden, I realized, you know, if they dug themselves. I mean, it, it, you know, the odds are ninety percent that this thing will be forgotten after a week, and usually it is. But the ten percent, where if the wrong person saw it, and only takes one, um, they could be in a lot of trouble. And um, this man-on-woman violence right now is probably not the thing to do again. Um, and if they don't, if there is no trouble stemming from this, I think they should consider themselves lucky and not push it. And if there is, um, they dug themselves into the hole, you know, because they did it. It's right there on their TV. I think they clearly thought about it in advance, which is why they did the whole Spike Dudley Lita thing on Heat, because she beat him clean, and they showed clips of it on Raw. So I think they were trying to portray her as someone who wasn't like a weak, helpless woman, but was somebody that could actually beat a man, because she did, and they showed clips of it. So, therefore, when she got beaten up by guys at the end of the show, it was kind of like she was one of the WWF wrestlers getting beaten up, as opposed to, if, you know, they dragged Deborah out there, somebody that had never been portrayed as a fighter or anything like that, and she was okay, the that's, one that got beat up. That's, so that's, I think they the, thought about it, but still, it's the whole thing the, with, like, the Vince Trish angle, where it doesn't matter if Vince got his in the end. It aired on TV. His, he and, got his uh, at the end. He got, got his at the end. Okay, but, okay, how much, how much revenge did Trish get on Vince anyway? I mean, that was a well, farce. None, but, I mean... Okay. His whole thing was, his whole claim was, it doesn't matter what we did on the show because, you know, I got mine in the end. When in reality, they had it on TV and it aired and people used that and they used it against him. So, same thing with this. Yeah, but I mean, what you just said, I mean, that's not going to fly in the real world. No. You know, if someone sees a clip of that and they go, well, you know, she did beat a guy on Heat. I just see that as their mindset. I think that's why they did That it. might be their mindset, but that doesn't, that's not going to mean nothing in the real world. Yeah. Just like the it's whole okay. uh, Vince's argument about Trish meant nothing. They no, it meant nothing. It meant nothing, too. You're right. Uh, let's see. What else? Um, I guess that was the, the main stuff. I mean, really, no. I heard the best wrestling match at the show was uh, was Jerry Lynn and American Dragon in a dark match. Mm -hmm. yep. so, um, I thought the main event, though, the Hardys and... I, liked, I really liked Austin and Helmsley the way they sold for the Hardys. And, oh, you know, yeah. the Hardys worked their ass off. I mean, they really... You know, they did a good job. They, you know, the loss means nothing because it was the girls involved in the pin. And I don't think the idea of this was to elevate the Hardys, which, which is the same thing I was told before SmackDown with the Big Show thing. When I watched it, it was like, how'd they get elevated? You know what I mean? It was like, elevated when he bench pressed them 16 feet in the air, all three of them at the same time. <laughs> so I don't, I, I mean, you know, I mean, again, I didn't see any elevation of new stars except for maybe Lita. Um, but... Uh, I don't know. You know, people are saying, okay, now I can have a lead against China, but I don't think we're going to be seeing that one. One good thing I will say I don't is, though, think so. No. I wonder what China was thinking last night when her role in the show was to say hi to Linda McMahon, and Lita's role in the show was to win the main event. Where was she buried? China? <laughs> she sure was. Yeah, well, maybe maybe yeah. she's finally. That's uh, what happened. 
Yeah. What goes around comes around in this business all the time. Uh, see, Champion Carnival Tournament, the uh, round robin ended today with uh, Steve Williams beat Toshiaki Kawada uh, with an armbar submission because they said that Kawada basically went in somewhat hurt from the match at the Osaka Dome last night. And so the with Kawada losing and Taiokia beating Mike Barton, it'll be Tenru against Taiokia, which is tomorrow in Sendai, which is actually late tonight, uh, for the Champion Carnival Tournament. So with Kawada losing uh, today and also losing yesterday in the tag, I got a feeling that Kawada's probably going to beat Mudo in their first ever singles match, which will be on uh, Saturday night at uh, Budokan. And let's see, XFL, uh, the Fast Nationals, which are not the Nationals. The Nationals probably just came out, but I don't have them. But on the Fast Nationals, the Saturday night game, which didn't go against basketball, or against, uh, was there any holiday Saturday night that we don't know about? Like some fake holiday someone can call? Uh, no. there's, let's see. Groundhog there's Day? Friday is next week. Does that count? Yeah. No. <laughs> a, week be- a week before Good Friday. Okay. Well, anyway, they did a one fair for Christmas two weeks early. <laughs> they did a one, se- <laughs> they did a one seven, which would be the second lowest that they've ever done. And the UPN show, or the UPN game, which, uh, on Sunday night did, an 0.6, which I'm sure those UPN affiliates are just thrilled with. I think that may be the lowest. That's the lowest rating I have ever heard of um, for UPN. It may not be the lowest they've ever done because I'm not exactly an authority on UPN ratings week by week. Sunday was Palm Sunday. <laughs> and the Sunday before that was All Fool's Day. <laughs> How oh. ironic is that? Yeah, really. Did you get, a, did you get the raw number yet? Because I haven't gotten that yet. I didn't get anything. Okay. Well, we should. I would presume that before the end of the show, we will get uh, the Ross. It's gonna be like this back. from now on, I think, with no competition. Yeah, because no one really cares. I mean, even yeah. WWF, which is which is where I actually get those raw numbers from. It's like it's it's not like at, at one thirty they're going, oh, let's look, let's look, because it's kind of it's kind of like that show last night. They um they you know you know what I mean it's like there's you can see that they're willing to do longer segments because they they got the audience and they're not gonna have a. How big a tune-out factor are you really going to ever get um, without, you know, competition? I mean, not not a lot. Maybe a little. Let's see. UFC has finalized its card for May the 4th. Uh, we actually pretty much had every one of these matches mentioned at one time or another on this show, except for the semi shield match, which we had on the website the other day. Okay, the uh, heavyweight title, Randy Couture, uh, defending against Pedro Hizzo, uh, which um, Pedro Hizzo's got to be the favorite in that one. Then lightweight title, Pat Militich against Carlos Newton, which is a good fight. Um, then uh, Pete Williams from Lion's Den against Semi Shilt. Semi Shilt is about 6'10 and a half, 255 pounds. He's the current king of Pancras. And um, very, the tallest guy I've ever seen in one of these fights. Tremendous reach. I mean, standing up, although I saw Gilbert Ibell hand in his head in a, in a stand up fight just because Gilbert Ibell is such an awesome stand up fighter. Uh, but it's. He's got submissions. Dangerous opponent. Um, Chuck Liddell against Kevin Randleman um, with a 199-pound weight limit. So it'll be the smallest we've ever seen Kevin Randleman fight because he usually comes in about 212, um, which is an interesting fight. Chuck Liddell is a, a good kickboxer, and he has a college wrestling background. So if he can avoid the takedown, uh, he might be able to beat Kevin Randleman. Um, I mean, Randleman will be the favorite, but I, I know people who think that he's going to lose. Then Ricardo Almeida, who's one of the uh, best Brazilian jiu-jitsu guys against gold medal winning wrestler Matt Lindland. So it's a very interesting fight. Matt Serra, who's Henzo Gracie's top student at 170 against Shoney Carter. And then uh, we've got Tony D'Souza against Steve Berger. Uh, that will be the first time both of them have been in UFC. And, um, I think Steve... and then uh, BJ Penn against Joey Gilbert. Um, I think B.J. Penn won the world championships in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. First American to do that, I think. And Joey Gilbert was an NCAA champion. That's a dark match, so it's a interesting show there. Uh, let's see. At theotherarena.com, there is a story up right now on the ECW bankruptcy filing. So it lists, it's actually, let me see, um, $8.9 million. It's theotherarena.com, by the way. No, the... The other arena. The, the other arena. Dot com, right? Other arena. Is it, it's just other arena? Yeah. Okay. Otherarena.com. dot com. Um, let's see. Oh, I'm getting more. Let's see if I have any ratings here. I do not have any ratings here. Getting faxes by the second. Um, anyway, 
the um, they had 8.9 million dollars in debts owed to wrestlers, production people, print shops, arenas, promoters, lots of television stations, lots of business partners. 3.8 million that Paul that ECW owes to the Heyman family, and they have 1.4 million. Don't forget million Tommy Dreamer's money. truck. Tommy Dreamer's truck, yeah. They have 1.4 million. That's, that's their assets. Tommy Dreamer's truck. No. Oh. Yeah, nineteen thousand dollars in assets. They have one point four million dollars in um, assets. Um, a half a million of that is their um, what's the word I'm looking for? Their claimed price of the value of their videotape library. I can see the videotape library. They owe the WWF. Didn't they uh, say the library was five hundred thousand? That's what they said. Yeah, that's okay. what they listed the worth as. Now they owe the WWF six hundred thousand. So that may be where they clear up their debt. Maybe with a fair WWF. trade right there. Well, I don't know if you consider it worth 600000 I mean, Vince, Vince may not consider it that. But then again, that may be the only money he's going to get anyway. That yeah, he may making, not have an option. Yeah, maybe he's making Paul work for like five years with no pay or something. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow, you know, when it comes to these things, the WF never... Like, companies, when, when people go out of business, always get stiffed, right? Somehow, yeah. the WF always comes out okay in these business dealings. See, that legal team that's very... Um, what's the word? Very good, I guess. Um... Thorough. Thorough, yeah. But they owed, let's see, a million dollars to a claim. There were a lot of big... But anyway, all of that is up there at uh, theotherarena.com. So, um, anyway, uh, you can look that up. Uh, let's see. We got on our poll today. What did you think of Monday Night Raw? A, excellent. B, good. C, average. D, bad. And E, awful. There's an interesting poll from uh, yesterday. This is, is it possible to run a profitable national wrestling company against the WF today? No, 27%. Yes, but only by copying WF style, 3%. Now, what I find interesting about that is because I will guarantee you that 80% of the startups will do exactly that, okay? <laughs> and, and we've actually had, because they will. Okay, so anyway, yes, but only by coming up with your own style, 36%, 35%. And then yes, that's Vince Russo and WoW. Coming up with your own new style. That is Vince Russo and WoW, as a matter of fact. No, well, no, I, 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 you know what, though? Wow is glow. That's 80s. That's nothing new. Yeah. But he wants mm. to change it. Okay, well, then it may be coming up with your own style. And then, yes... Did I tell you got a greeting card? Did you get that greeting card I got from that website? I got one, too, but I deleted it. I didn't have time. I just was too busy. Is there anything, like, in there that I should, like, know about? Absolutely or? not. Okay, well, Mine then... I just said, I will make Wow a success. Good for him. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, yes, doing old style, but with good booking and logic, 36%. i got to say, on that last one, which actually got the most votes of all, that if there's one thing that I'm really convinced of right now is that doing 80s wrestling um, will not work today. Um, I've just seen just too many examples of guys that do good 80s wrestling and the public doesn't buy it. I think you need something completely different. And I wish that was wrong. What kind of 80s wrestling are you talking about? I'm just talking about Ohio Valley wrestling at, at just okay. the angles. The angles make sense. The workers are actually getting fairly decent. And, you know, you know like that last show that they did really, I just thought it was a real eye-opener um, last Wednesday at just how much they fell, um, you know, with, with the wrestlers actually getting better. And it just tells me that the current, if you, the current fan base, okay, only wants WWF. That's the reality of it. Because that's why nobody else is, is doing any business. Um mm -hmm. I think that to to um, to do something on a big basis, you got to come up with a new concept, um, and I don't know what that is because you know before, um, you know we talked about this before. Before, like when we talked about the, you know you could steal a new concept from Japan. I mean, ECW was basically FMW, which was a big success in Japan at the time, and a lot of the other stuff you know was was taken from Japan. Um, a lot of concepts, you know, Bear, you know Bischoff, you know, man, Bischoff's everything, right? The, the junior heavyweights was, you know, something that, that that New Japan had been doing for years. The promotion versus promotion was what he saw when he went to that Tokyo Dome show. So, the, you know, and right now, um, as we have discussed, with the exception of Pride, which is totally different, um, and it is totally different, as a matter of fact, but there's nothing in Japan in the pro wrestling world that's very novel that can be stolen and brought here. So, they're going to have to come up with their own rather than steal the new concept from Japan. It's tough. It's a tough business. Let's get to some emails. So, Brian, Saturday was Passover, so that's the excuse. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's see. This is from Gabriel, who goes, Why do good girls like bad guys? I thought guys? it was Sunday. What? 
Passover was Sunday. It was? Yeah, but I believe the holiday starts at sundown Saturday, so. Oh, okay. So they got, so, okay, now wait a minute. That means that sundown Sunday is over, so that's not an excuse for the UPN rating, but it is an excuse when we get the TNN rating any minute now, which won't be good. Uh, why do good girls like bad guys? Why are we doing, oh, cause it's all my fault because I started with the Linda McMahon thing. Okay, there are plenty of women locked into abusive relationships who take so much shit and then put up a strong front. It could hit some of the audience. Yeah, it's that sure women hits a lot of the right. audience. Yeah, got another one. It was the first night of Passover. <laughs> it's Passover like an eight-night holiday. Hanukkah is, I know that. I don't know. Okay, yes, do you think if I'm not mistaken, it is. Okay. I'm not sure, <laughs> but I'm almost positive it is. And I am, but I have no clue because all I do is watch wrestling. Can we get a rabbi to call in, please? <laughs> do you think Taikea will really beat Tenru in the finals? I hope I so. Don't think so. You think so? I, I don't think so. I don't know Tenru's if I think so, but I hope so. Yeah, it'd be cool, but I don't think so. I don't see it. Uh, Tenru wins going to his match with Fuyuki on the Kawasaki show next month. Uh, how would you use the character of China in the WWF? I would make her into a new character of this horrible author. Uh, let's see. What kind of heat did uh, Austin get from the fans last night on Raw? I was watching in a bar, so I couldn't hear the fan reaction. I thought I heard cheering, but I could have been wrong. It was mixed. Oh, no. I heard it was about 40 to 60% cheers, depending upon the point of view of the person listening. Uh, did you get a weird feeling about Deliverance when Austin said that Ross had a pretty little cowboy hat? Well, obviously that's what it was taken from, so yes, that's exactly what I got. <laughs> um, I hope the WF isn't using Spike Dudley just to take crazy bumps every night. He has great potential if they give him a chance. No, that's exactly what, that's how he got his job. We'll be seeing nothing but that. He did nothing but take a beating last night. That bump into the post where he did the helicopter to the ground, I thought, that guy's done. He's done. Then Albert Press slams him over the top all the oh, way to the floor. Oh, Albert threw, just threw him. Like, he just, he tossed, kind of just launched him. Yeah. And then well, they killed what... him backstage. X-Pac, incredible, making fun of him. At least X-Pac didn't make fun of his physique. I was waiting for that one. That would have been a headline <laughs> article. <laughs> uh, what is the background of Shofunaki? Who trained him? Uh, he was from Michinoku Pro, so I guess he, he was trained over in Japan. I heard he's from San Antonio. He lives in San Antonio now. He's not originally from San Antonio. Do you know why, he, Brian? Do you know why he lives in San Antonio? He was working for uh, Michaels, wasn't he? Okay, well that's what he ended reason? up doing because he lived in San Antonio. Do you know why he moved to San Antonio? It's actually yeah. an interesting story. I don't know. Okay. Um, when he got the job with the WWF, he was such a big mark for Shawn Michaels that he moved to San Antonio so he could live in the same city as Shawn Michaels. And then he ended up getting a job at Shawn Michaels School. <laughs> Everybody laughed about that in Japan. Um, I mean, he's like the biggest Shawn Michaels fan in the world. You know, when Shawn, when, when, when August comes and the Hall of Fame balloting comes in, you know, they're really, Shawn Michaels really does deserve to be in. Um, for reasons that, like, every single wrestler we have on this show that's young always points out. But, God, you know, people that have been in wrestling, <laughs> they Especially hate Especially after this last incident, he's got no chance. I don't know that he has no chance, but he didn't help himself. Hey, he's only got, hey, you know what, though? He does only have himself to blame, though. I mean, that, yeah. this last incident was, you know, you can't put that on anyone but him. Uh, which wrestlers from UPW were signed to developmental deals? Um, have the twins been released? I don't know. We're going to have, um, we're going to talk to Rick Bassman real soon so we can ask him about the twins. I mean, I know they got Nathan Jones and Prototype and Aaron Aguilera signed. And I don't know who else. I think Justin, is McCulley? I don't even know. Uh, who else? Um, I think there may be a couple of others. Um, Tom Howard's not. Oh, gosh. I don't remember off the top of my head. I'm almost halfway through the EMLL pay-per-view. This is from Rob Bahari. So far, it's great. The first two matches were really good. The second match was unbelievably good. The introductions are being nice, and the production values are way up. That's awesome. I'll probably have a tape of that in just a few more days, and I'm always looking forward to good stuff to see. Who was responsible for all the misogyny angles on Raw recently? Paul Heyman? That is what they did in ECW. Uh, have you ever heard of a wrestler named Jeremy Lopez? Isn't that isn't Jeremy Lopez the uh, WCW red-haired referee? No, I've heard of Jeremy Lopez. Jeremy Lopez is a wrestler for Wildside, but I think it's the same guy as the referee that, that was WCW referee. I think. Huh. Uh, I remember I Jeremy know. Lopez, referee. Why would they give Linda McMahon that horrible WrestleMania theme from 10 years ago? Are they trying to kill her heat? No. I mean, Linda they McMahon and Jim Ross are the two... Yeah, Linda McMahon and Jim Ross are like the two top baby faces now that Rock's out of the picture and, and Austin turns, which is really weird watching a show like that. 
Uh, is it me or is Vincent Cruz control now that he doesn't have to compete against WCW? Um, it's just you. No, it's not. <laughs> Whatever happened to Axel Rotten and Jeff Jones? Um, uh, Axel, I sometimes see his name on Indies. Jeff Jones, I have not heard his name in a while. Um, I also read in the torch last year a fan died at a party after doing drugs given to him by Jeff Jones. That was, in fact, in the torch. Uh, there was definitely a fan. It was a fan. It was Mikey Whipwreck's brother's best friend. It wasn't at a party. It was at a bar. And he got GHB and drank GHB and he died. I don't know that he was given it by Jeff Jones. Uh, um, so, but yeah, that's, that story is very true. Uh, how do you think Vince convinced Linda to do this humiliating angle for her? I can just picture him telling her how it's going to go down and Vince at the end is going to get his. Don't worry. You get to kick me in the gonads. I think Linda does it gl- gladly because, you know, Every, everyone loves to be on TV and loves that the, the addiction to that cheer. I mean, I saw it. You know, remember, um, I guess it was last Monday night when uh, Shane, it was last Monday night the night that Shane was at WF New York? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And he's out there and they're just cheering Shane, Shane, WCW and all that. And there was something I saw in Shane and it was like he was taking it like, uh, you know, for a, especially for a guy who's on the manipulative side. I'm not saying he, you know, it's like because, you know, he's a, you know, because he's, he's from the, He's, you know, part of the, what is it, writing team, creative team. So the people who are part of the creative team know that their job is to manipulate the audience. So then when the audience is manipulated, instead of taking it seriously, they should know this is how we manipulate our audience. So don't take it seriously. Nevertheless, the people on that side still end up being marks for that rush just as much as, as the, and they shouldn't be. Um, it's just so addictive. And I just saw that, you know, when, I just how, how um, there's certain reaction to him, and it was like, oh, my God. You know, it's like he's he's got the bug too. You know, I mean, that's what the people have in wrestling is is the bug. That's like kind of a word there, and that's why they can almost never leave because the you know once you've been bitten by the bug, you know you know you never want to leave because you just love that adulation that you know once you're not on television you you don't get anymore. That's why all these guys always come back. So, but anyway, um, as far as you know, Linda knows. I mean, she's admitted that her acting is not exactly the best, but she's the real wife and fits in the storyline. She's going to do it. Uh, let's see. Uh, Spike is going to be wheelchair-bound if the WF keeps abusing him the way they are. If he keeps taking bumps like being thrown out of the ring by Albert, he won't last long. But he's like, you know what? the one that really got me. Yeah. One thing about him is is that you can, you can see this in him, is that he gladly does this. I mean, he really loves it. And it's not a knock. I mean, it's. I mean, he just does. He really loves it, and you can just see how happy he is to be in the WWF. I mean, he had that. You know, I mean, you know, he started wrestling out here. He had that. Uh, let's see. Uh, seems that having Austin beat up on Lita, the most popular woman in the company, is a desperate attempt to get Austin over as a heel. The match was basically made to get Austin over. Did nothing for the Hardys. Um, I just read about the match and don't know if they had any good spots for them, but I assume they did. No, they they sold a lot no, for the they, Hardys early. They put the Hardys over strong. Yeah, I, I mean, thought they, they were selling from like crazy until. Uh, I I loved the work of Austin and Hunter last night, both of them. I was watching that going like, yeah. hey, you guys are doing a, a, you're doing the, the perfect job in this match, you know, to, to mm-hmm. sell for those guys. Uh, do you think this turn? I, mean, was, was, I mean, the thing with Austin is he did it the first week. You know, first week he was Jim Ross, got to beat up Jim Ross. Second week it's Lita, so I'm sure they're doing everything they can to get him over as a heel. I mean, yeah. once he's over, they don't have to worry about doing stuff like that. But at the beginning, especially with Austin, that's stuff they have to do. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, because everybody wants to cheer for him. They still do, and they always, you know what? They always will. It's just like with Flair. It's, just, it's gonna, they're gonna have to beat it over people's heads because they just want it. Do you think the turn is not working as much as the WF hope by having them him do this? I think we'll find out when uh, the the attendance figures come in um, as far as the future. That's that's the real gauge. It's not. You know what? If every person, if 100 percent of the people cheered Steve Austin next week when he comes out in wherever city they are Monday. And they sell out and they do a big pay-per-view with Steve Austin against The Undertaker, and then the turn worked anyway. You know, that's the key. You know, it's not yeah. like what percentage of the people cheer or boo. It's, it's how many people will buy the next pay-per-view. Uh, which, with that main event, I don't know how many that'll be. That'll still <laughs> be, be good because it's WWF. It won't, be, it, won't be, uh, it won't be half of the last one, but I don't think anyone expects it to be half of the last one anyway. Uh, do you know what the WF plans are for Tori? Uh, she was revealed, and then she vanished. She's doing the, the tough enough stuff. Isn't that what she's yeah. up to? So they're just taking her off TV. That's all. Um, let's see. If these last two Raws are assigned what the WF is going to become with no competition, the fans are going to suffer more from the demise of WCW than most of them realized. 
Uh, yes. I think we've been saying uh, that for a while. We said that before uh, this even happened, before the, 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 they even went unopposed. Um, let's see. I've read a lot of negative remarks about the Lita angle. Well, that's a big thing. Uh, what are your thoughts on how women are used in the WWF? I like the angle with Lita and Steve Austin. I think it elevated Lita for a title match with China. <laughs> no. Mm-hmm. no, it didn't. Uh, ethically, I don't like that Lita was portrayed so weak. It portrays women as weak and unable to defend themselves, which makes no sense because Lita is actually the best female wrestler the WF has. I she so was really portrayed as weak. No, she was protecting... I mean, they showed the footage of her beating Spike. She won the match, and the reason she was beaten up was because she was overwhelmed by two guys with chairs. They could have overwhelmed well, anybody was, like that. She was protecting, and she was protecting Matt. She was saving yeah. Matt from the beating. Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't like, uh, you know, she was doing all these high-flying moves, and they just stood there, and she fell off them. I mean, they jumped her and pummeled her with chairs. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Considering the awesome talent roster WF has, there's no excuse for putting on the kind of garbage we saw last night. Think of the endless combinations of matches they could put on if given time and how awesome they could be. They could just throw Benoit and Triple H out there for 15 minutes and have them tear the house down. Well, they could. Uh, maybe they're saving it for another time. Instead of putting on horrible segments like the Linda Vince segment, if used properly, this roster could put on great shows like three previous pay-per-views every single week. Unfortunately, that does not look like that's going to happen. This is way too reminiscent of WCW 1996-1998. It is weird. There are some weird stuff. Uh, let's see. From Levi Tinney, who goes, is there any news on Rey Mysterio's chances for a slot in the new WCW? Nothing new. Nothing new. He has not heard anything. No, no final decision has been made. Do you ever think we'll see the return of Juventud Guerrero on the national level? Uh, Juventud Guerrero is, what, 26 years old? So I would say, mm-hmm. yes, we will. We will. He's too talented. That if he, uh, He's another one. If we don't, it's his fault. It's not the fault of the companies. Because if Juventud Guerrero uh, plays his cards right for the next year, um, I can't imagine the WWF. I actually, I can. I take that back. I can't imagine somebody else that opens up a national promotion that he would be one of the first guys uh, that they try to take. So... I would say he will get the chance, and, and hopefully he will not blow the chance. Uh, Actually, I was just thinking back to, to the previous uh, letter. If you have, like, pay-per-views that are exactly like the Raws, or Raw shows that are exactly like the pay-per-views, where you're getting 15-minute matches on both and great matches every night, or at least great matchups or whatever, there really isn't so much of an incentive to buy the pay-per-view as opposed to having, like, you know, what we had on Monday night, or maybe a little bit better without all the storylines and everything like that, and less Vince and Linda, but, you know, build stuff up on the TV shows, and it can be a little bit slower, and then you have to actually buy the pay-per-views to see the good long matches, and I think that, really, that's probably better for business. I mean, you can't give it all away for free on TV. Why buy? Okay. Brian, now i got a question for you. Who the hell makes the decisions in Japanese wrestling? I mean, they give their pay-per-view matches on TV for free a week later. Yeah. Can you, you know... That's good. I think that's retarded. I don't get it. You know, I was just watching the New Japan from the 31st, and then they showed, like, all the highlights of the uh, Misawa and Akiyama match with Hashimoto and Nagata. And I'm going, like, you're doing it again. It's like every pay-per-view. You know what, though? I can can almost see that because pay-per-view is at the beginning over there. It's in its infancy. And I, I can imagine, like at the very beginning, you know, you, you do some great pay-per-view matches and you give them away for free on TV and you let people know that this is what they're going to get on pay-per-view. And then you slowly stop giving so much away. So by the time more people can get pay-per-view, they know what they can get, but they don't get it anymore. You know what I mean? Okay, I can see your logic there, except the only thing is is that they already have a history of giving good matches on television and all it does is, you know, like... Pay-per-view did not take off in Japan like it did here because if you go back to when pay-per-view started in this country, which I guess would be mid-80s, uh, WWF pay-per-views, you know, you, you had to pay for your house show matches, and TV was not, nothing but two-minute or three-minute squash matches or longer squash yeah. matches, but you never, got, you never got main events on free television. And so the idea of, um, if you were a longtime fan... The idea of seeing the big match, you would go to the you would go to the arena and you'd spend your you know it was only five dollars then, but that's whatever it was the price you know. But you would you had to pay to see the big match. That was always a yeah. part of American wrestling. In, in Japanese wrestling, the mentality has always been that you eventually that you get the the big match for free. And I think that like because of that, I think that they have to hold something back from TV to make people think that you know pay per view is something that eventually you have to buy. Yeah. So. Uh, let's see. This is from Tom Green, who goes, I think Rick Cornell is excellent in the ring. That's, um, Reno, who I, I believe they picked him up, by the way. Although I, I, 
I, I cannot confirm that name, but I'm, I would just think that they have. Uh, I hope he gets a chance in the new WCW. This past summer I saw him in the best squash match I've ever seen. I don't think I would call the match a squash. It was for Worldwide against Vampiro. Well, then it wasn't a squash. Uh, Vampiro made him look really good. They did some out of the ring brawling. They kicked out of each other's finishers. And the move Vampiro used to finish the match was unusually good. It was He power bombed him. It was the first time I've seen him do that finish that I know of. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, um... Let's see, is the real Ultimate Warrior still alive, or is it his twin brother? We have to answer that. He is still alive. His brain died many years ago. It's but the same he, body. Yeah, he's sort of still alive. New brain. Uh, when is that Mexican wrestling tape coming out that you mentioned you worked on several months ago? Mexican, Mexican. wrestling. He must be talking about the Wrestling Gold. Wrestling Gold's coming out real soon. I don't know exactly when, but very soon. Did Terry Funk's friend who refereed his retirement match, like Dennis Stamp, in Beyond the Mat, really have an exterminator gimmick? No, Dennis Stamp. <laughs> Dennis Stamp never had an exterminator gimmick that I'm aware of. Um, he did wrestle, though. I remember he was actually Dennis Stamp was actually a pretty good wrestler. And I mean, I know that people, you know, if, if you've seen that movie in the Los Angeles promotion, this would be in the mid '70s. Dennis Stamp was when Gene LaBelle got old, he became the company policeman, and and that's actually a foreign term to most people. But in the old days. A lot of the companies had a guy who was generally speaking like an, either an amateur wrestler or just a tough guy who would be the company policeman. And people would come to the office, like, you know, Marks or whatever, and go, I want to be a wrestler. And they would put him in the ring with the company policeman whose job was to basically break their ankle or break their face and just beat the hell out of them. And, um, you know, so anyway, I just, I don't know why I brought that up other than I thought that, like, you know, most people who watched, um, what was it, uh, Beyond the Mat probably did not picture that that was Dennis Sounds Stamp's like role. Good. When he was when he was a wrestler, but that's in fact what it was. Uh, let's see. If Mike Tyson accepts Tank Abbott's challenge, okay, forget it, forget it. <laughs> Stop right there. Crash okay. bin. Um, uh, will Rock be back early if the movie shuts down due to the strike? Absolutely. Who trained Molly Holly? Do you know who trained Molly Holly? She's from Minneapolis. I'm not sure. I have I mean, no she, idea. A lot of it was. I mean, I know she trained for a long time at the power plant, but I don't know if, if that's where she started. Maybe. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, let's see. Uh, this is about ECW, ECWA Saturday Night in Delaware, which actually I never got a report on. The crowd wasn't that hot, but the matches didn't suffer much. The highlight was American Dragon and Low Key against the Haas Brothers for the tag team titles. The Haas Brothers really showed their stuff, and they should get a spot on TV soon. They really improved on the mic as well. American Dragon turned on Low Key with a Connecticut connection. Uh, still Low Key walked away winning the straps from the Haas Brothers doing a 540 splash. 540 splash. Is that three revolutions? 540. How can you do a... F- Wait. 540. Wouldn't 540 be a centon? No, a centon would be 180. No, a double centon. Like a 450 to a centon? Yeah, which would be a 540. Yeah. Okay. Well, anyway. Uh, all four competitors deserve a television spot. I'm really impressed with the constant improvement, consistent improvement of low key each month. At 21, with three years in the business, he can really be great. Yeah, I've heard. I have not seen Loki wrestle, but I've heard a lot about him. Uh, let's see. Okay, Would pass the mat spot, the 540. The 540 centon off of the launching pad. Yeah. And this guy wasn't even going off the launch pad. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Passover is a 10-day holiday. Oh, good. So they can they can uh, use it for next weekend too. For the playoffs. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, awesome. What are your thoughts on Tori Human's workers? Shima, Sua. Uh, let's see. Shima's awesome. Sua's, Sua's very good as well. Uh, let's see. I was wondering what was up with the Dusty Rhodes Midnight Rider angle in the suspension in 1988. Um, that's actually a really funny angle and that they started, they, they suspended Dusty Rhodes for I don't know how long it was. Maybe let's say 60 days, okay? The number could be wrong. And so they start this thing where the Midnight Rider came back, you know, which of course was Dusty Rhodes under a mask, against Tully Blanchard. And they'd done this angle many times in the 80s. So, so people, like, knew it. And, and the people revolted on it. And the houses were horrible. And, like, two weeks later, I think they had Paul Bosch as figurehead commissioner. He just announced, like, one, one Saturday on television. I didn't even know this one was coming. But I knew that, like, the Midnight Rider Tully thing was, was dying. I mean, it was like this feud that was just dying. And Paul Bosch is on TV Saturday morning. He says, we've, we've, uh, uh, what's it? We've, we've lifted the suspension on Dusty Rhodes. And he just came back. And, and they never referred to him as a Midnight Rider again. 
tons of emails and faxes. I want to make a correction. We've got several emails about this. I got confused. Jeremy Lopez is a wrestler that was on WCW Saturday Night. He was um, with uh, what was it, Tony, the guy Tony Mamaluke and a couple of the other guys that came up from Dean Malenko. They were trained by Dean Malenko in Florida and uh, were brought in as cruiserweights by Chris Canyon. The red-haired referee is Jamie Tucker. So anyway, that's okay. where I got confused. So they're two different people with the name Jamie. Um, no, they're not. Just, no, Jamie is Jamie Son. No, I just got confused. There's no excuse. Uh, let's see. Uh, here are the excuses coming up for the low ratings for the XFL. Next week is, of course, Easter weekend. And then the week after is a new moon. So that's for the championship. Uh, let's see. Which federation had the Nicho Santo hair versus mask match? Which, by the way, I just watched last night. Um, and the match is very good. It was not... Um, if you, Some people compared it to the Tajiri match with uh, Psychosis from ECW. And it was not... I don't think it was nearly as good as that. But it was still... Um, it's a 30-minute match. I mean... And it was very, very good. And uh, Psychosis did... Or Nicho did a great job in the match. I mean, he really did a good performance. A lot of, you know, dives and, you know... Very good match. Uh, it was Promociones uh, Baja California, I believe was the name of the company that uh, promoted it. Uh, what happened with Shawn Michaels at SmackDown? I don't know. He was just unable to go on there. I don't know. You know, I'm not hiding anything. It's They assumed that he was impaired in some form and could not perform. Uh, but he clearly could not perform. Uh, let's see. Now that Rock is out of the picture, why haven't Benoit and Jericho been elevated to a higher babyface position? We ask that every day. I do not have an answer. Uh, someone goes, I saw a commercial for Manhunt, which is a new television show on TV. It looks like paintball war, and one of the participants was Prototype. That's interesting. Really? That's what they said. I mean, I don't know if that's true. I hadn't heard that. I would think I would have known that, but I don't know. They were talking about they weren't going to use any WWF guys or anything on the show. As well, he's not a WWF guy. He's under developmental deal. Yeah. Huh? I don't know. I don't know if it's really him, or maybe they just got a bodybuilder who looked like Sting. When is that show going to start? I don't even know they have commercials or anything yet. Yeah, I don't know. I don't Yeah, I don't even know when it's going to start either. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, more about... Got a lot of emails. God, I guess I confused those two guys. Uh, let's see. Uh, I don't think you're going to get any better than the one that just came in, and I'm going to send it down to you. But apparently a guy writes in and says, Wasn't the table tennis pro-am on ESPN 7 at the same time? <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, TSN uh, did not show most of that angle at the end of the show last night, which actually makes two weeks in a row. Uh, so anyway, um, uh, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's say something about Russo in just a second, because we've got a couple of emails. Here's the situation. Um, we're not going to, at least I'm not, Brian can say whatever he wants, but uh, I'm not even going to bother anything with Russo, because until he does something in wrestling, again, I mean, if, if someone wants to bring up facts from the past, that's fine and well and good, but you know what happens when, I think that Russo is looking for this, and other people have, obviously, as everyone knows that's followed the show, they look at attempting to get in this internet battle, um, and what happens is, is when you do that, when you, when you start responding, everyone forgets the facts, like I can go in there and say, well, this is the fact, and this is the fact, and people will just ignore the facts, and just go, oh, it's those two guys fighting. And I just don't feel like being involved in something as stupid as that right now. So I'm not going to. I've seen this trailer for Max Payne's movie. I could have sworn I saw a drug deal. Hey, you did. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, after seeing Hardcore Holly and Rhino in the ring together, I came to the conclusion that Bob Holly must be a super heavyweight. I'm sick and tired of Heyman talking about the man beast when he looks like mini-me of Brian Clark. Uh, let's see. What did Rick Rude die of? Uh, it was a drug overdose. When will Max Payne's movie come out? Never. Uh, <laughs> you count on that one. Oh, no. How far back does the WCW tape library go back that the WF recently purchased? Will it include stuff from Crockett's NWA days? Yes, it will. And yes, it does. Uh, let's see. Uh, more on Russo. Uh, let's see. Uh, How would you like to be in charge of cataloging all that? Just getting to sit on these old wrestling tapes. Eh, you get paid for it. What the hell? Yes. Hey, there's a lot worse jobs than, than than having to go through old wrestling tapes, especially in the WWF. Especially those old those old '80s Crockett tapes. Some of that stuff was really good stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, it's from Jeff Jack Jackson, who goes the segment involving Vince and Linda had to be one of the worst segments I've ever seen on WWF television. The build up to all this, and all we get is a divorce. Hey, divorce is a big deal. That's a billion dollar company split in half. I'd rather see. You know what I no what I hated most about that whole thing is the whole build up 
was for Linda to say she wanted a divorce in an attempt to do the same voice that Vince did when he asked for his divorce. And I thought, that just utterly killed it. She just said, you know, I want a divorce, dude. Instead, she had to try and mock him or, you know, copy his growl or whatever, and it was just terrible. And he goes, I would rather sit through a no time limit match, Iron Man match with Billy Gunn. How can a no time limit match be an Iron Man match? That means it never ends, I guess. Between Billy Gunn and David Arquette. Well, that's a scary thought. Uh, let's see. Does that mean we can look forward to a series of Lita Steve Austin matches? Oh, Brian just talked about that. Um, goes, a lot of people complain about these kind of segments at the end of Raw promoting violence against women. Personally, I don't think it encourages real life violence, but it's not the kind of thing I enjoy watching. See, I'm like the opposite. I don't, well, actually, I don't think it encourages real life violence either. Um, but it can be used um, as, a, as a scapegoat for it. But mm-hmm. I did, I, I have to say as a fan, you know, knowing because Lita is a professional wrestler and everything, um, I did enjoy that segment. I thought it was great heat. But I would never have done it. Um, you know, when, when you're running a wrestling company, one of the things is is that you cannot book for what you enjoy. And, I, I mean, you should book for what the fans enjoy. But sometimes you also, you know, if the fans want to see, like, you know, um, you know, someone getting their head chopped off, you know, you have to know that, well, if we do that, aside from the fact the person will die, we'll probably be taken off the air. So you've got to, like, give the people... What you can give them without without being stupid, um, and this one is what they did last night. Um, it may not, you know, it's like it's a, it's a, it was a risk. That's all. It, it's yeah, a but risk. would and you have thought about that in advance? Um, I don't know if I would have because I didn't when watching it, so I I could say I wouldn't. But at the same time, um, there should I have been have someone d- there that would have. Okay, okay, but I wouldn't have done that segment. I wouldn't have done that segment because I would have thought, not necessarily the Tiffany Unit thing in advance, but as far as repercussions in advance, yes, I would have. I would have thought of that. But, but the connection to that murder case, which someone, with actually several people emailed to me later that night, no, I, I don't think I would have thought of that specific thing, but then as soon as those emails came in, I started thinking like, oh my God, it's more dangerous than I really considered. Anyway, mm-hmm. uh, let's see. A lot of people have made the comment about that segment saying that that's how you make someone a heel. Maybe it's just me, but if taking if, if having Steve Austin be the woman merciless with a steel chair is what it takes to get him over as a heel, then it just shows how desperate they are to get him over as a heel. Hey, they are. Everyone wants to love him. It's not easy. <laughs> I mean, that's the reality. Um, however, I don't think it worked for one reason. As brutal as this beatdown was when we see a man beating up women on, re- on a semi-regular basis, it does lose its shock value. The G- Jim Ross can scream about how sick this is all he likes, but how sick can it be if both faces and heels have been, been doing it regularly to different degrees? Yeah, I used to hate when they start, like, when, when um, they would have these matches, you know, when Lita would be in it. Remember when Lita was, was with, with Benoit or somebody? And, they, and you know, like, they're, you know, Lita, or, or China, too. Actually, it was China was the one that used to bother me. It's like China would be pounding on these guys, giving them low blows, not selling for anyone, you know, for months. And then finally, like, some guy would put them in a cross face and it was like, you know, they were beating up a woman. <laughs> I used to say feel sympathy for him, yeah. Yeah. It was uh, like the whole saying, thing last night. I mean, they had, um, it was Rhino versus Crash and Molly. So Crash and Molly are supposed to be a tag team. And she never even tags in, and Rhino gores Crash to death. And then Molly hits the ring, who is his build tag team partner, and Rhino goes after her, and Jim Ross is just appalled. And I thought, she's on he the team. Been a, she, he he should have been. Valet, he she's on the actual team tonight. That's right. He should have been appalled by the matchmakers for making such a match yeah. in the first place. Okay. So, anyway. It's from Chris, who goes, TSN cut raw again. The last three minutes were all, the, were all crowd shots, and towards the end, they pulled the plug on the show. In fact, did you hear about that, Brian? They actually pulled the plug on the show a couple minutes early. Hmm. Um, they went straight to regular program. This is strange. It was 11.05 Eastern Time. What five-year-old kid is up on a school night um, watching Austin beat Lita? You know what's scary about that <laughs> statement? Surprised statement? By how many, uh, you would be surprised how many, because show. they are. That's, the, that's what the demographics say. I mean, they were... They're they're usually at the end of uh, they're they're probably like eight hundred thousand to a million. They weren't all five, but um, under under the age of eleven. Anyway, uh, let's get to the phones. Let's start with Phil in DC. Phil, what's going on? Hey, how you guys doing? Hey, uh, we're doing really good. Uh, a couple of things. Um, from what I know, uh, Funaki was uh, Fujiwara Gumi in Battle Arts before he was Mikanoko Pro. Yes, you're right. So he might you're have been right. trained by Fujiwara. If people wondering who he was trained by, it's so weird that he was a Shawn Michaels mark because he doesn't wrestle anything like him. I mean, he's like yeah. all that. I mean, at least in Japan now, he's just kind of does just takes bumps. But before he was all mat work. Like, yeah, that it, would have been from his bat, probably battle arts and Fujiwara training. Yeah, right, but I mean, you know, Shawn Michaels not not necessarily known for his stellar mat work. 
No. <laughs> I mean, that's like absolutely the worst thing. Maybe, does. maybe they, maybe he admired him because he was American that got all the girls. Yeah, had nothing to do with his wrestling style. <laughs> um, a couple of other questions I had. Um, oh yeah, Jeremy Lopez. He was a Saturday Night guy. He used to hit some. He used to team with in six man with the Vianos back when the Young Dragons just started out. They had like wrestled three or four times on Saturday night. Oh really? Yeah, he's a good match. He's a pretty good wrestler. I mean, he's pretty. Um, I, I saw I saw him wrestle at the Pillman show last year. Yeah, he, he was a good wrestler. He's kind of kind of bland, but you know, solid. Sm- like he's a lot more like so a lot more like technically solid than a lot of those other guys they brought up. Yeah. So I mean, but I mean, really, sort of very. Uh, I mean, it wasn't flashy like most of those guys. Um, what was it? Um, what is Reno flashy? No. Uh, no, but he's big. Okay. <laughs> I mean, he's one of the smaller guys. Bigger. Yeah, you, Reno was a PowerPoint guy. Yeah, and I always thought Mar- Molly Holly was Starless Sexton. Isn't she was. She? she was. Yes. Right. So she must have. She was wrestling a long time before she was. No, that's not Sue. Se- okay, that's not Sue Sexton. Starless. She's only. She's only like twenty three or twenty four years old. Oh, she's really? really young. Yeah, she's only been wrestling. You know, I think she started when she was nineteen. So she might have been wrestling four or five years. Okay, so she wasn't like she wasn't in uh, like power. No, that's Susan Sexton. Oh, oh. who's really old? Susan Sexton's like Bill Apter's age. Oh, okay. I think they. I think, and I'm not making this up. I think <laughs> Susan Sexton and Bill Apter used to be roommates at one point. For useless trivia. That's that's why I like calling this show, Dave, because Lord knows where I'd find that out someplace else. And the only other person who would know that is Bill Apter and Susan Sexton. Because nobody else is old enough to remember. <laughs> oh, um, <laughs> they would probably deny it. No. You uh, you need to get your hands on some Loki. Maybe I'll uh, send you the Super 8. You probably mm-hmm. can see that anyway. Just I got a the... tape of, believe it or not, I got a tape of the Super 8 here. Oh, well, I haven't watched it yet. Watch, yeah, watch I, the Loki I, matches. He he does some stuff. I mean, the Super 8, the American Dragon Loki match, that's, pro- I mean, unless I see something, that's easily the indie match of the year. And it's really weird because it's re- compared to, like, a stylistic thing, the way, uh, you, at least a lot of the stuff I've seen, especially, like, in Revolution Pro down in California, too, that indie guys are trying to work a lot stiffer. Like, that was the big problem when you go to these Super 8s over the years, is you see guys work really loose. Like, that'd be an indie thing, is you'd see guys with, like, really bad punches and really bad, especially when it's live and you're 15 feet away and you can see them completely whiff the uh, punches and kicks. But um, all the American Dragon matches, all the Loki matches, I mean, they were really, really tight, especially the final. They were just killing each other, just kicking each other really, really hard. And it's just kind of this neat thing. I don't know uh, whether... Uh, Brian, that's something you, you know you see in the matches you wrestle. Tim's always yelling at people to not punch at all because he thinks they're just horrible. <laughs> but there's, like, nothing like, ro- there's nothing worse than, than like guys trading bad punches. Oh man, yeah, yeah. Jo- Joey Matthews, Christian York. I, I don't know if they've gotten any better, but they were like back when I used to see them around because they come from the Northeast and they trust a lot of Indies. Joey Matthews had like the worst punches I've ever seen. I mean, he was like you know there was like he was like daylight. You know, really bad. You just, I mean, just everything else somebody does when they, when they, you know, start throwing punches and on a big comeback and then you can see six inches just kills your entire ability to watch a match. But like all this work in the Super A, it was all really like, I mean, Loki and American Dragon were kicking each other as hard as a lot of stuff I've seen in Japan, mm-hmm. which is shocking for U.S. indie guys because usually it's just. But, but these guys, um, I mean, like, you know, a lot of those guys, like, they, they pattern a lot of their wrestling after from, from Japan tapes. It's not like, Say you're, you know what I mean? Years ago, where people didn't, you know, it's like a lot of the, a lot of the indie guys watch a lot of tapes. That's why you know our styles and melting pot styles, as opposed to just that pure eighties American style. Yeah, that's something. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's really cool. I mean, it's something that I know, yeah, I mean, you noticed spots being incorporated maybe three or four years ago, but the stiffness seems like it's something that came in sooner, like more recently. Mm-hmm. So you should watch Super Eight. I'd, I'd be interested to see what you thought of that. I think, I mean, I, I was one of the probably better live shows I've ever been to. I've been to a bunch. Like from yeah. start to finish, although I didn't think the Haas brothers were any good. Maybe they've gotten better. But they didn't. Mm-hmm. I didn't think they looked very good in the match they had on that show. Real, uh, like the opposite of everybody else. All their strikes were really, uh, really stinky. All oh, they had nice suplexes and they were big and you know muscular. Um, and I had a question about the tape library. I know they were doing Turner on Turner South. They were showing old, old NWA stuff. Now the right. WWF owns that, or they could stop doing that. And I know uh, that, yes. And yes, I they thought they stopped doing that. And I thought they also just started showing those shows in Japan on Samurai TV. 
like maybe a week and a half ago. The WCW Classics? Yeah. Yeah. What I, that show's something? been canceled, so I'm sure if they were getting it from, uh, you know, feed yeah, that, that deal that deal's out the window, and, and I don't think WF has any TV deals in Japan. Um, I mean, they're on. Well, I shouldn't say that they have the one where um, the raw the raws on, and I mean, the, one of the they they do have that one TV deal, but they'd have to go through the WF TV deal. Now, there's something I just heard. It was um WWF. It was something in Japan just got a TV deal, some television show, and now I don't remember what it is. Someone just mentioned it to me last night about a new. TV show that was going to be on one of those, you know, Samurai or something um, from America. But now, well, I don't NWA Gold, which is was supposedly this from the, like a classics kind of program that was going to show regional wrestling, was something that supposedly just started out. And I know that somebody who gets taste from Japan, one of the people I deal with, mentioned to me that what they were showing initially was just the, the uh, Turner South program. Mm-hmm. I guess Dusty, supposedly Dusty was involved somehow, and like the initial idea was that they were going to show like regional wrestling from all the different NWA promotions from like the yeah, eighties on cut matches. But yeah. it, 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 ended up, it ended up being mostly the Crockett stuff, though. Right, and so, the old, you know. And uh, one other, uh, so I was just what, what you guys thought. I actually, I actually watched Raw last night. It was the first time I watched them fast forward, so I was able to burn through that Linda McMahon interview, which I'm sure was agonizing in real time. But um, I think they could probably get a bigger buy rate if they ran the Hardys against uh, Austin and Triple H at the pay-per-view in like a ladder well, match than no, they could they're not gonna do it. Kane and Undertaker. <laughs> but do you agree with me? Because I actually think they're probably people like people are mm-hmm. more interested in seeing that than they would seeing Kane. I just don't think Kane and Undertaker are, are draws anymore. They got top spot. They have to beat up Lita every week. I don't know if they're going to do that. <laughs> yeah. Let's get a couple of emails here. Uh, this says, Prototype is one of the Manhunt Warriors. He was promoting the, sh- the show on the television show Extra under a really bad 80s wrestling name like Crazy Ken or Bad Brian. Huh. Does Linda McMahon own a large percentage of the WWF? I thought the company was mostly owned by Vince. Actually, um, Vince and Linda each... I mean, the, the Vince and Linda each own, uh, I guess, what would be about 80% of the company? 70, I think seven, maybe 77%. And I think the other 23% is public. Um, something like that. Um, a lot of, let's see, there's about 3% owned by NBC. And then uh, there was 3% owned by Viacom. But wasn't Viacom the one that dumped, like, a lot of their stock? Yeah, Viacom dumped a bunch. And, uh, yeah. So 23% was of it. Was that Kevin Dunn? By, yeah, he dumped a bunch. He made a lot of money. Um, yes, yeah. yeah, so the, the McMahon family owns about 77% of the company. Uh, let's see. Did Stan Hansen knock out Vader's eye in a match in Japan, and then they kept wrestling? No, he um, he <laughs> pounded him in his eye, and uh, you know, blackened the eye, something fierce. I mean, eyeball was just hanging there by a ligament. Yeah, it was hideous. But uh, yeah, they kept wrestling. They were okay. Uh, let's see. Will the WF be going ahead with Steve Austin versus Jim Ross and Triple H versus lead a double main event at Backlash? <laughs> Maybe they could add Albert and Spike to make things even better. Uh, let's see. Who are the front runners in starting up a new federation? Nep. No one. So the first guy to get TV. Are ratings out yet? I have not seen the ratings, no. Uh, let's see. On Amazon.com, they say Wrestling Gold comes in on April the 24th. So that's the video that uh, Jim Cornette and myself, or the DVD that Jim Cornette and myself did voiceovers on. Uh, let's see. Taz said that Molly Holly was trained by Dean Malenko. So. Uh, could be. It's probably right. Mm-hmm. Uh, can you elaborate on what happened to the Ultimate Warrior? <laughs> Brian, what happened to that guy? What's that supposed to mean? What, what happened he, to him? He's well, living he, in, uh, he's, he left wrestling he's living for a while. He started his Ultimate Academy, tried to sell various things, sold approximately none of them, and came back for a brief run, was horrible, and disappeared. Um, yeah, well, uh, he's I'm living in Phoenix. History. He, yeah, he's living in Phoenix, and... Uh, you know, the last he was supposed to wrestle was on a tour of Australia, and he got the whole tour canceled because he forgot to get his passport in time for the tour. And uh, <laughs> that just tells you why he's not in WWF or WCW. Well, well it's WWF. There is no WCW. I, th- I think there are other reasons, but uh, that's one of them. No, 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 but that's part of... No, it's, it's the big picture. You know what I mean? Okay. It's like, that's not the reason, but it's the character reason. I mean, if you don't get your passport in time for your trip and they cancel the whole tour, someone who would do that is likely not to be responsible enough to keep a job in a real company either which, in fact, he didn't. Uh, I remember WF had a primetime special on NBC with the big boss man against Hogan and Savage. Um, do you remember how it did ratings-wise? 
Uh, God. I, I know. Um, they did, uh, do they do like two primetime specials on NBC? Primetime as far as? Not, not Saturday Night Main Event. They had, they had the primetime one. I remember the other one was like Hogan. Was Hogan and Andre the primetime one? Hogan and Andre was the first one. It did a 15.2 rating. I remember that okay. one because it's the biggest rating that uh, any, probably any wrestling show has ever done that I've ever heard of in this country. Um, and I think that they did another one a year later. I don't remember. Um, but yeah, it did you know the, the the second one didn't do as good as the first one? But I think it, it. In fact, the second one did not really do all that well. And the first one, the 15.2 was considered pretty darn good, but not. So, some people expected it actually to do better. Uh, and then it was, do you think a WrestleMania Survivor Series? Okay, let me ask you a question about yes. the 80s. Okay. Okay. They have Hogan versus Andre getting a 15.2 yes. rating. Yes. And that was the match where it was the evil twin, correct? Yes, that was the evil twin match, yeah. So lots of shenanigans. And a lot of Americans saw this match. And uh, I don't know if that has, you know, everything to do. I'm sure it doesn't, but... You know, American wrestling was always considered this goofy thing with guys in their underwear, blah, blah, blah. And what would you think would have happened if it would have been like Flair Steamboat to a clean finish uh, that got a 15.2 rating? you think people would have generally a different impression of what pro wrestling is? That's an interesting question. Uh, maybe wrestling fans would, but the general public, I would say, probably well, yeah, not. That 15.2 was not all wrestling fans. It had to have been a lot it was, of it was, it was it was it was just uh, well, it was NBC prime time that was before yeah. you know I mean you got to remember in those days so that's like the exposure that a lot of mainstream people got of wrestling this big fat guy this tan bald guy having a match with this uh, fake referee and all this goofy stuff going on and that's the impression that they got what if Which they seen the Flair and Steamboat having a hell of a match and a clean finish and fans cheering and everything like that. Um, it would have it would have made it more difficult for some people to knock it, but they still would have. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, I, I remember the first time they did a Saturday Night's Main Event because it was, it was, it was Bruiser Brody, um, who had, this was a time when you know all Japan and New Japan had been prime time, you know, you know, and and big time prime time rating successes in Japan for years, and they did Saturday Night's Main Event, and it was they did all the goofy stuff, you know, that they did, and Brody said, you know. Um, in Japan, we've had prime time for 30 years, and the reason we've had prime time for 30 years is because we don't, you know, make fun of our product, and you know they're going to come out and they're going to have a big run, but they're not going to have prime time for 30 years. As it turned out, they didn't have prime time for 30 years, and neither did Japan. <laughs> but um, you know, I mean, it did last longer in Japan, if nothing else. Uh, let's see, how much would it be worth? We talked about this yesterday. For CBS to put uh, WrestleMania on free TV, would it make money on advertising? They have to sell 17 million dollars worth of ads for it, uh, you know, or they have to pay $17 million to Vince for it, and they're not going to do it, so it ain't going to happen. Uh, is Dynamite Kid in the Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame? Yes. If he can get inducted, why can't Shawn Michaels? Uh, probably because Dynamite Kid changed the business a lot more than Shawn Michaels did, even though you could argue Shawn Michaels was a better wrestler. He, he, I mean, I don't think Shawn Michaels changed anything about wrestling. Dynamite Kid opened, you know, Dynamite Kid and Satoru Sayama, you know, changed the style of work um, and opened it up to a lot smaller people. Uh, Robin Kreutzer. So historically speaking, I think he was a more pivotal p- person. Uh, not in this country, but worldwide. Uh, and in this country, in, in, a, in a roundabout way. Robin Kreutzer was wondering what happened to Brian Anderson in Smoky Mountain Wrestling. That's always son, and I don't know what happened to him. Uh, Jim, who says, is Vince going to have a second XFL season? He says he is. If he was smart, he wouldn't. I want to say I went to some Demons games. The arena experience is very different from watching it on television. Is there a second season? How can they increase TV ratings? It's the million-dollar question that I don't have an answer for. Let's go to Charles in Connecticut. Charles, what's going on? That's the $100 million question. Hey, how are you doing, guys? Question. Doing really hey. good. Um, do you have a, a list or a partial list of the wrestlers that were released from Time Warner? No. I know the of confirmed a few. confirmed list? Oh, uh, yeah. But I, I, don't, I, don't no. know all, I don't know all of them. I mean, I know Vampiro's on it. I know Chris Daniels is on it. But I don't know. Like, I don't have a complete list. Norman Smiley? I don't know about Norman Smiley. He might be. I don't know. Um, I, I I saw this on the internet and uh, kind of had my doubts about it, but uh, said that uh, Ric Flair said that um, when he was going to Vern Gagne's wrestling school that um, he quit one time and that uh, Vern Gagne came to his house and dragged him in the backyard and beat the crap out of him. That's, that's pretty true. much true. Is yeah, it that's really? pretty much true. Yeah, that's pretty true. Yeah, uh, Vern must have been a pretty tough guy because uh, Ric Flair was Vern Gagne was at that time. 
Vern Gagne was um, a legend in wrestling. I mean, you know, I mean, he, um, when, and of course, he was a lot older then, but Vern Gagne in 1948 lost a very close match to, um, God, who was it? Uh, Henry, 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 Henry Wittenberg. And in the Olympic trials. And then Henry Wittenberg beat everyone in the Olympics and won a gold like it was nothing. So Vern very likely was the second best wrestler in his weight in the whole world, you know, at his, in his prime. At the, you know, 191. You know, you know so something else to think about, though. I mean, let's say that I were like this great college wrestler or whatever. And I went to Ric Flair's school. Say Ric Flair had a school. And I quit. And Ric Flair came over to my house and dragged me in the backyard pound. and was beating me pound. up. I would not do a thing. I just lay there and get the. It's just out of respect. Yeah, you probably wouldn't. Yeah, fight like back. I'm gonna that's fight true. back at Ric Flair. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's that's that, that's actually where because Vern Gagne, you know, when he was training Chris Taylor, and I don't know if you people remember Chris Taylor, but he was like, you know, he was he was an Olympic uh, bronze medalist in wrestling. He was much younger and was also 450 pounds. I mean, Vern used to slap him around in camp, but I mean, if like if they got into a fight, I mean, Vern was 50 years old. I mean, I think Chris Taylor could just fall on him and like. Break his ribs, <laughs> you know. <laughs> he was a big guy. Yeah, yeah. Um, I saw um, Jerry Lawler at a, a baseball card show over the weekend, and he said that uh, there, he might be involved with some kind of new promotion. That there are people. Uh, I'm sure he's hoping that. Yeah, because <laughs> some guy asked him. He's like, "I hope I see you on TV again." He's like, "Oh yeah, I'll be on TV." But he, he said before that he wouldn't be. You know, there was very little chance of him being in WWF. I mean, you know, put it this way, whoever's going to open up, I mean, he is, you know, Jerry Lawler is like the first person you call to be an announcer. So it's not like, you know, whoever whoever gets something, it's not like, you know, yeah, he's going to, you know, just question how long they can last. But, you know, I would think he'd be like, you know, he's on that A list of people that you call right away. I mean, um... Seeing as how he, um, they kind of gave Lawler his release kind of that same day that the sale went through and everything like that. Do <laughs> you think that if somebody started up, like if Bischoff suddenly got Fox and was announcing that he was going to start up, do you think Vince would call Lawler back pretty much immediately? Um, depends on how much of a threat he thought it was. If he, if he didn't think it was a real threat... No, okay, if it, was, if it was the Fox TV network, like real Fox in prime time, let's say on a Friday night, yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, because that's a real time slot that would be scary. If it's like, say, Fox Sportsnet, you know, or something like that, at like at midnight on Sunday night, uh, probably no. Okay. Is Hulk Hogan still under contract or no? No. He's not under contract to anybody. Do you know what he, if he's trying to start up a Fed now? You always hear talk of that. He's always trying, of course. He's any, anything to con people out of money. <laughs> the thing is, like, I always... And keep, his name, and keep his name alive. You know, I keep hearing that people are going to start up federations and stuff, but... uh. I mean, Every, well, hey, everyone's going to try, and whoever gets the first, whoever gets TV, will will have a chance. I mean, the whole keys, the keys not, you know, the keys to TV. I mean, wouldn't you need like Ted Turner like money to be able to compete with WWF? Uh, to compete with WWF on WWF level, absolutely. <laughs> but but you don't need to compete on WWF level. I mean, you just need to be able to survive um, survive at, at a decent budget. I mean, if you if you want to spend three quarters of a million dollars a week on television, yeah, you're going to need a ton of money. And it's, I mean, it's going to be hard without the big names. I don't know how many guys they could get, like maybe Luger or somebody like that, or or Nash. Mm, but yeah, that's a problem names. too. If you think of that, <laughs> that was scary right there. Yeah, well, I just thought that I wanted to see Luger, Luger and, on uh, TV again, but yeah, all the guys that, that that Vince doesn't, you know, yeah, you're going to get all the guys Vince doesn't want. Well, you can get Van Dam, and then <laughs> could you imagine Luger and Van Dam <laughs> like in the gym <laughs> talking over their match? You no, know, you can't do that. You can't do that. You can't do that. It's like, what can you do? You can do a wrist lock. <laughs> Luger but you can go on my shoulders on for a now. torture rack. A headlock. Stand there while I clothesline you and miss you by a foot, but you got to go down. Wrist lock. <laughs> That's right. He doesn't know that one either. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks a lot, guys. Okay, very welcome. Let's go to Ed in Texas. Ed, what's up? Yeah, Dave, I wanted to know, uh, what are the chances that the WWF, to keep some of the WCW wrestlers in shape, would send them on house shows and dark matches? They could if they want to. It doesn't seem like that's the idea right now, though. Okay. I mean, I, I thought... I mean, know, if just, they're not going to bring Rock in for a dark match for TV to try and get people there, I don't see him sending the young guys to, you know, WWF tapings to give them some work. I, I don't understand why right now some of these guys, like uh, like O'Hare and them, aren't, aren't in Ohio Valley right now. Yeah. You know why? You know, they should send them there and get, you know... I mean, why let them get rusty for two months before you put them on TV, especially because they all need more work anyway? Mm-hmm. So yeah, I mean, the fact that they're not doing that tells me 
Or maybe, maybe they're working on that right now. I mean, they haven't made too many yeah, software decisions yet. Yeah, hopefully, yeah, maybe, yes, right, maybe within two weeks they'll do that, and that'll be good, and they yeah. should. I hope they do, because the last thing they need to do is have, like, a bunch of guys look good, but be like Billy Gunn and be blowing up in a minute or two on the, on the first TV. Yeah, show. on the first TV. I know. By the way, you That's guys are be shocked at the amount of positive Billy Gunn feedback that I got after answering an email and feedback about why mm. was Billy Gunn horrible. That, it was just way too many. Mm-hmm. Oh. He's bad timing. He's always blowing up. He doesn't seem to care. <laughs> I try to explain. It's sort that. of like what Brian wrote, as I recall. <laughs> he's. I mean, he's good in tags, but he can. He cannot carry a singles match by himself at all. Yeah, they tried. They tried. You know when they split up those New Age Outlaws and gave Billy Gunn the King of the Ring? I mean, it was like he was supposed to be a main eventer right up there with Austin. Didn't quite get there. Yeah, yeah. He. He just. I think he blew it with that Rock match because that was one of Rock's worst matches that he had. It was the one mm-hmm. with him with a. Where he had to kiss the, the, the girl's butt. Yeah, okay. Mm-hmm. And stuff. And then I also, um, I wanted to ask about, um, have you guys had a chance to, to see that Beyond the Map that I was talking about a couple weeks ago? I know Brian was joking about it earlier. You mean you mean the DVD portion? No, not the DVD. The one that I told you I had called about is just on videotape. At the special oh, the edition. new videotape version? No. Okay. Now, I, I think you guys should really get this because I think you guys would really love it, especially you, Brian. Because you seem to enjoy that eye hanging out of the ligament. By the ligament. Oh, I mean. that's right. Yeah. That's what you're talking about. Yeah, I mean, you would really love this tape. It's, I, I think my friend bought it at, like, a Super Kmart. And, um, like I say, you guys would really laugh. Laugh, laugh. I don't, don't want to say ass, but, yeah, you guys would laugh your asses off <laughs> of this tape. It's so funny. And also, Check that out. wondering, is there any chance that maybe you could get maybe, like, Scandal or Akbar on the show? Uh, if I could find where he is, I would like to get him. Yeah, yeah I, don't I, where, one, I don't know. I don't know where he is these days. Because I heard one guy ask about him on your show, and I went and I heard that interview, and it was really good. He's really he gives a lot of like insight into the business, and he was telling like what the payoffs were for the Parade of Champions, and that Kamala was kind of pissed because he didn't get nowhere near as much as the Von Erichs, and I bet he didn't. Oh well, jeez. <laughs> he said that they made like something. Yeah, like, right there. They made something like seventy-four to eighty-four thousand dollars just on photos alone of the Von Erichs. I was there that day, and I wouldn't. That was an amazing. Believe me, that was an amazing day. Yeah. So, you know, I, I was at. I was. In, I'm here in San Antonio, and I, they showed it uh, on a what do you call it? They the showed it closed circuit. Thing? Yeah, yeah uh, showed the closed circuit in San Antonio. Yeah. Yeah, at the Freeman, and and, then, and it was like halfway in the middle, so it was only like half half the building that they sold tickets for. And I, I have never been to a more emotional show in my life, and it wasn't here in live, it was on the closed circuit. Yeah, that was uh, the moment, there was a moment, it was right after Carrie Von Eric won the title from Ric Flair, where uh, uh, Fritz and, the, and Doris, which was uh, Carrie's mother, are walking down the aisle, and then Carrie is walking down the aisle, and they meet like three quarters of the way down the aisle and hug. It was actually one of the most amazing things I've ever seen in wrestling. It was just so... Uh, it, was, it was just, it was, it was, you know, I mean, there are people that are at that show. I mean, like the magazine writers and stuff that were all, that all flew in and everything. And I remember after that show, I mean, nobody had ever seen, it was not a great wrestling show by any means. And, and the, the matches were too short and it was 105 degrees out and, 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 and all these reasons why it should have been terrible. But it, whatever it was, there was something that that show had that I've never seen in American wrestling. I don't know. It was the right thing at the right, the right result of the right match at the right time. You know, I mean, the pop when Kerry Von Eric beat Ric Flair was unbelievable. Oh yeah, I mean, even in the Freeman, I mean, I, I'm, I've been to so many WWF shows where it's been sold out, and I've never heard it get so loud and for for an ending of a match. Yeah. Like, well, like, people have been waiting for it for years, and then you know you had the emotion of the brother dying and everything that played into it. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. But you know. It, I'll tell you what, if they had promoted that show well, because they did 32000 legit in that building, I think if they had any kind of an undercard and promoted it well on TV, because they really didn't, they could have drawn 50,000 people. I mean, they had, it was one of those things, it was kind of like the, they had the angle, and they didn't really take full advantage of the angle that they had, but even by not promoting it well, it was such a strong angle that it, it you know, that, at that time, in 1984, 32,000 people to a wrestling show was an incredible number. I have a few questions. Now that Linda wants a divorce, is there any chance of her using her power to give Shane the raw time slot? No. No. Um, <laughs> it would be a good angle, but it ain't going to happen. What is the point of the WF even having a light heavyweight title that never gets defended? 
Well, there certainly was no point last night. He didn't even bring the belt hey, when, down. Uh, when did he win that title, by the way? Was it on Heat? It was on Heat a, know, a month ago, maybe? It was before me. And he came out with the belt last night, and I went, I didn't even know this guy had the title. Yeah. Never and somebody mentioned something a couple, I think it was last week, they go, why have Rhino squashed your light heavyweight champion? And I thought to myself, it's Crash, he's not the light heavyweight champion. I thought it was yes, still Dean Malenko. He, he, yeah, he beat Malenko, huh? Shows how, how well they publicize it. Uh, what do you think of Flash, Rob Conway, and the guys from Shawn Michaels School that are in Memphis? Um, also, could get Flash on the show. We had Flash on the show once before. I think Flash is really good. Uh, Rob Conway, he's all right. He's all right. Um, Spanky and American Dragon are very good um, in MCW. Uh, they're, they're, they're the two best. Have you ever seen a British wrestler called Johnny Saint? He wrestled in the 70s and 80s. His wrestling style made Gene, Gene Malenko's chain wrestling look dated. I have heard of Johnny Saint. I know Johnny Saint was like the lightweight champion in England. Yeah, I would say in the 70s. But I never saw him wrestle. Um, I want to comment on the violence against women issue. How can when Linda kicked Vince, people were not up in arms about promoting domestic violence? Is that is it that we see it's okay for a woman to kick a guy in the most sensitive part of his body? Actually, believe it or not, there's a total double standard, and it is. I don't know. Um, I mean, because China was doing No one ever complained about that, but... But it also, um, the announcers never portrayed it as anything wrong, but whenever the male wrestlers beat up on the female wrestlers, they do portray it as something wrong. So it's both WWF and real life. Um, so anyway, uh, let's see. Is it safe to say if Crash is mixed up with Rhino and Kai and Tai and S.A. Rios are going to the new WCW? We don't know that. Although they may, that the light heavyweight title will be disbanded. It doesn't matter if it is or it isn't. Uh, okay, the second NBC Live... Uh, primetime show was Hogan and Savage against Boss Man and Akeem. Yeah, that was when Hogan and Savage turned on each other. It set up the Savage Hogan WrestleMania match. That's right. And I don't know the rating of it offhand, but um, I think what it was may have finished then. Uh, I think Savage walked out and Hogan was left with both of them and beat them both up and left them for dead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> Something like that. I don't remember offhand, but they, they did the big split. Because this was, this was really good because... The thing I remember about that show that I remember the most, so this would have been in, um, in, in early 1989, was they did this angle where um, I think Savage did like a tope and hit Elizabeth. And I mean, she took a hell of a bump. She really did. So then they go backstage, and Hogan is like hovering over Elizabeth, and the camera goes on, and Hogan goes... Um, Tizim or something like that, which was the carnival for, you know, give me a time cue, but they're already on the air, and Elizabeth's going like, uh, are we on the air yet? And like, we're, this is live, and it goes through on NBC, <laughs> and then they go right into character, and it was the funniest thing in the world. So anyway, uh, but they still, but Hogan and Savage still did a great buy rate, so it didn't really matter, did it? Uh, let's see. Uh, this is from Andy Patrizio. Goes, I cannot imagine, this is about uh, McLean and Russo, I cannot imagine this partnership lasting long. Well, seven, if he beat seven weeks and they beat the old record. The, w, the WOW girls are mostly aspiring actresses and they are not going to wreck their names in this town doing Russo's typical degrading sexist angles. Plus, you're right about touring. Half the wrestlers are either busy at personal training or want to be actresses and they would never want to leave town. So any word on who the new sugar daddy is to keep this company afloat? Don't know. But, uh, well, no in September. Yeah, if there is a September. The new season. If there is a September. Well, there will be... September for us. I don't know about for them. <laughs> speaking of the 80s, they will call them... That was very uh, speak, They should call the new WCW show Saturday Night's Main Event. Mm -hmm. They own the name. Uh, it's going to be Nitro. Why would they have Shane McMahon show up in a limo with WCW? Yeah, it's going to be Nitro. And then you're Nitro right. listed as like the state. Yep, you're right. Um, this is some person who's mentioning the same thing. Can you recommend... Some UFC tapes are easy enough to find in crappy suburbs with nothing but blockbuster video stores. I'm trying to get into MMA, but I'm 40 miles, miles away from any place that's cool. Wait, wait a second. Is he asking us to name tapes that might be at his local blockbuster? Yes, he Why is. Why don't you go to the blockbuster and look? <laughs> How are we supposed to know? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> what if Eric Bischoff buys enough stock in the WF where he owns 51% of it and takes it over? Yeah, good luck. <laughs> they only have 23% out to the public. Vince did not put that company up to the public with any to, to give it any chance of anyone ever getting 51% of it and having his, comp his, his company, his family lose the company. I mean, they, they will never be, they will never have more than 49% of it go public unless, you know, they're going broke and they're forced into it. It's just not going to happen. Um, 
Let's go to Curtis. Curtis, what's going on? Huh? Hey, Curtis. Yeah. I was wondering, when is Paul Heyman going to still be in the WWF for a while? Uh, until they fire him. Probably. I hope he gets or fired. Or he, quit, or he quits. Or he quits, one or the other. I hope he gets fired because he's annoying. He always, yeah. like, whenever an ECW wrestler comes out, he goes, Rhino, the last. ECW champion are just incredible. <laughs> the man beast, I know. I know. Or every I time there's like, a reason for all that. I know. And he's he trying keeps to protect going, his buddies. He goes Sorry. like, he like says the only CW you could r- r- stay around here is ECW. When Vince McMahon, when they were talking about the WCW thing, mm-hmm. he's annoying. I if, I swear if he would have like stayed a moment longer, like on the Raw, I would have just turned it off. Because you know when he was doing. His own thing last night on Raw. You mean a moment yeah, longer until JR came out? Yeah, I mean, yeah, until he came out. Because he was annoying. He's always in, he was making fun of JR's, you know, his disease. He was making fun of it last you know, night. You know, I, I, I don't know like that. Ma- but was he making fun of that? Yeah. Oh, he, squ- he squinched up his face when he did some, and, and kind of talked out of the side of his mouth. Yeah, he did. I, oh, okay. I didn't That's like so that, cool. but since, you know, JR could tell him not to and he wouldn't, so, so I can't, I can't feel bad. I mean, I can not like it, but it's like I don't feel sorry for Jr. because you know it's you know what I mean. If he said don't make fun of him, I'm uh, sure Heyman wouldn't do it. Hey, what station yeah. is this show on? Because I got this what? number out of magazine. This, this show that you're listening to, the radio right now? show. Is it, yeah, what what station is it on? It's not on a station. It's on iata. dot com. Uh, just go in. I can your hear in the background of your house, kid. Are you listening to it? Uh, no, I'm listening to a uh, TV. Okay. Okay, so it's iata.com. Yeah, uh, you know who they should get? You remember that ECW guy, Joel Gerdner? Yeah, I remember. He was real funny. I wish they'd get him instead of Paul He can't do those limericks on, uh, he won't be able to do those limericks in in the WWF, though. Oh, yeah. They would really get in trouble. Maybe WCW at 11 o'clock in the morning. 11 (laughs) 11 o'clock, yeah. At 1 in the morning, yeah. Yeah. How how come people thought what they did, what Stone Cold did Lita was like, Women abuse or whatever. What, why did people think it was? Yeah, I didn't think they were it was abusing like, a woman. <laughs> yeah, but still, I thought that was funny. When Triple H uh, had a greeter. I mean, I didn't think it was funny because it was against a woman. I just thought it was funny. funny. I already knew that was... Someone huh? Yeah. Funny. It's funny that, that was my emotion. One of my, I already knew that Stone Cold was going to become a bad guy because some guy told me, like, a couple of days before WrestleMania it was going to so happen. He doesn't listen to the show. Huh? How old are you, Curtis? Uh, I'm 13. Okay. And you watched all of Raw last night? Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay, we're going to go to the next call. All right. Okay, let's go to Dave in Atlanta. Dave, what's going on? Hey, Dave. How you doing? Doing really good. Uh, excellent. That, and people wonder how uh, how many young folks can watch Raw neither. <laughs> oh, man. i got a few Starting questions right for i got a few questions for you. Number one, I was wondering, uh, they said someone was going to be elevated. Uh, why Linda McMahon? Hasn't she been elevated enough? <laughs> hey, that's what they... That, that wasn't their I'm just chance, telling, but, uh, I was told it was going to be the Hardy Boys, but, uh, you know, I guess when it was over, people didn't see it. That that, that actually happened. That's I a Buff and Luger elevation, if I've ever seen one. Good Lord. Well, that's what, that's what I thought on Thursday when I watched SmackDown, when I was like, hey, it's going to be really big for the Hardy Boys, and I watched it, and I was like, I thought that was the way Scott Hall elevated Hector Garza to main event status. Pretty much, yes. yeah. Uh, a few questions for you. Number one, have any of the big names uh, signed up with uh, WCW so far? No, none. None? Not okay. Even, Booker, Booker T hasn't even signed yet, so none of them, no. Okay. My next question is this. I was watching a, uh, one of the few interviews with Buddy Landell today. I was just watching and listening to that. Any chance you think, uh, what do you, how do you think he'd be in this capacity? I was thinking if they sent him down to Memphis Power Pro to help the guys with interviews and such, I mean... Because when he's motivated and cleaned up, he is one of the better workers and interviews around. What do you he's think? He's really out of shape, but that has nothing to do with interviews. Um, it's an interesting concept. Um, I, I don't, I don't know that they would. I, I, I don't know. I mean, he would have to sell themselves on it. You know, Buddy's got a tough track record. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but you know, of course, that's the, that's his past too. Well, but, Buddy he, could also, if he knows he's out of shape, he could still talk on the stick. And I mean, yes, with Bobby can. Eaton down there and. Buddy, I mean yeah. that'd be a good combination down there. I thought you know, for Memphis. You know what? I gotta. We, if anyone knows how to get a hold of Buddy, we gotta get Buddy on the show because he will be a great. Isn't he in Memphis Championship Wrestling though? Buddy's he's not in Memphis Champ. 
In, in the interview, he said he's on the net all the time and does emails and all. I also found out that uh, Scandal Aqua has a web page, too. Okay. And the URL is uh, www.maxpages.com uh, slash devastation. Devastation Incorporated. He's still doing that. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, and I suppose this is authorized site. He did an interview with some, uh, with, uh, some other radio online. It was pretty good. Uh, and I remember, I, if I, I'm I not used mistaken... To, I, I used to hate, like, like at the beginning when he, they first started Devastation Incorporated in um, World Class, this is like 82-ish, and uh, it was the campiest thing, the way it started out. It was, like, just so funny because it was King Kong Bundy, and he was going to find out who the boss was, which ended up being Akbar. But, like, years later, you know, when, when Akbar would just keep making comebacks and they'd call Devastation Incorporated, it was just like, oh, God. It's just like that name just got so old and dated. Like the NWO. Know, no, but this was like seven years. NWO was only like three years, so it was like twice as bad. And one other thing I was going to say about possible guests, I was Buddy Landell was at the top of my list because I thought he'd be just fantastic to get on there and everything. Yeah, he's he's now on the top of mine too. I got to find this guy. <laughs> I'll, I'll look around. So if I find a link to his site or something, I'll send you an email or something about that too. Uh, I was okay. also I, thinking I about his number somewhere. You're more connected than I am for sure. Yeah, I was thinking possibly. What about Jerry or Jeff Jarrett? Or uh, any, any chance with them? Jeff would have to be out of his contract. I would love to have Jeff Jarrett as a guest. Um, he'd have to be out of his contract with WCW. So I, I think that's got about a year to go. Jerry obviously could do it. Jerry would be. I don't know if Jerry would. I don't know that Jerry would do it. But really? um, I guess we could ask. I'll give Al the number and everything like that. But um, you know, I mean, there's certainly. Jerry has no contractual prohibitions for doing this show. <laughs> if he wants to do it, he can do it. And, and Jerry, one other thing, I was Jerry thinking... Jerry Jarrett's a smart man. Yes, very much. I was thinking also, a lot of, with, with your guests, a lot of the ones you don't think would be great turn out to be fabulous and everything. I mean, on paper, you think, you know, they, they might not be the best. I mean, just talking to friends of mine, we think, you know, the Z-Man, how great is he? Hey, he's one of the better ones you've ever had. But uh, what do you think about these guys? Now, I don't know how they be, but uh, what about uh, New Jack, Kong of the Barbarian, and Paul New? I talked to Paul New a while Paul back. New. I haven't heard that name in years. I think New He's Jack would be a funny interview, but I don't know. If... We, we, we were supposed to have him on one. No maybe like that one Vampiro interview that we had. Remember that one? Yeah, it'd be, it would be and like that, actually. A little insane. Yeah, that, that would be a... That would, yeah, would, would, uh, no, not like Vampiro. It would be like, uh, what's his name? Um... Shaggy. Oh, that's right. Violent J. No, it was Violent J. It was Violent J. Sorry. Insane, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you think there might be a... I mean, you know, I won't know about Kong the Barbarian, but he's been around for like 23, 24 years or something. I mean, you know. I have I have no idea. I've spoken very few words to him. Uh, no, no one has. That's what I'd like to hear what he's got to say. <laughs> Along with Paul and you. I mean, he was pretty good when I sat down after an indie show about seven, eight years ago. And he, mm-hmm. it was an interesting take, and I mean, you know, I wouldn't have thought Max Payne would be as great as he was, but he was fan fantastic. I just love the yeah, show. Yeah, I really, I really like Max Payne a lot. That was a very fun show. Yeah. So. Well, thanks a lot. I'm gonna let y'all go. I appreciate y'all helping me out and answering my questions. Uh, do you think when Spider-Man the movie comes out that Vince will take back Savage, uh, even if it's just for the press and nothing else? Uh, as, as far as it comes to Savage, if Savage is willing to come in at a very low price, Vince will take him. For a high price, no way. Uh, have you heard of the rest, have this TV show Wrestling with the Past in Canada? Yeah, I've heard of it. It's been airing on Saturday nights. Um, it's part of an old documentary. I have not seen the tapes of it, though. But it's like they interview a lot of the old wrestlers, Pampero Furpo, Kowalski, Mad Dog, Carpentier, Don Leo Jonathan, those type of guys, talking about the old days of wrestling. Uh, let's see. WWF had three primetime shows. Um, Hogan and Andre with the double Heb- Hebner's angle. The Mega Powers explode with Akeem and the Boss Man against Hogan and Savage, where Hogan, it was revealed, was lusting after Elizabeth, which, by the way, that one did an 11.6 rating. The first one did a 15.2. And the third one was the Hogan versus Savage match uh, with Buster Douglas as referee. It was supposed to be Tyson as referee, but he got knocked out in Japan like a week before. So they got Buster oh, yeah. Douglas in his ref. And then Buster got no- knocked out Savage for the finish, or after the finish, I think it was. But it was a t- that one did a 12.8 rating. So those were the three shows. Uh, let's see... Uh, da, 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 da. Do you know if WF has picked up David Flair as one of the 24 guys? Um, he's not one of the 24 guys, but they have. This is not like an official like contract being sent, but there has been word given that they will sign David if he wants to, which he will. 
uh, to a developmental deal, um, but not not to a, ma- a major deal. So he'll probably end up at OVW. It's probably where he should end up. Uh, Linda McMahon having power back in WF doesn't make sense right now. If she can't bring back The Rock from being suspended like fans would expect her to, fans will be looking at bringing The Rock back as her first decision she should make to get it Vince right off the bat. That's the way that uh, she just said he was injured. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well. Seriously. That's, yeah, yeah, you're right. Uh, who and where is Hakushi? Well, who is Kinsuki Shinzaki is his name. And where is... Uh, he wrestled at the Osaka Dome show yesterday, uh, but he's in Japan, and he works for Michinoku Pro, and he also works for a lot of the other groups as well. Um, in that special, Macho Man walks out in the main event, and Hogan still kills a and boss man, like you said, but they go to a locker room shot, and Hogan is telling Liz to do something about Savage, and then Savage attacks Hogan from behind, leaving Hogan laying. Okay. If Didn't he break Hogan, the belt, too? Or was that another what? show? What? When he broke the belt? I don't... I don't think it was that one. Okay. If Conan won't be allowed to work for XPW due to his contract, why were Chris Candido, Shane Helms, and Shannon Moore allowed to work indies? It's it was every decision is different. There's no consistency to that. And Ray Mysterio Jr. allowed to work Mexico. He may have had that. Ray may have that in his contract. Doesn't Turner own the name Nitro because their Saturday Night movie is called Saturday Nitro? Yeah, but uh, I'm sure that one of the things they bought was the right to use the name Nitro, being that it was on Shane McMahon's license plate. Uh, let's see. Uh, will Nitro air in Canada on TNN uh, because we don't get Raw on TNN? Um, I think that's up in the air. I don't know the answer to that. That's a good question. Uh, let's go to Charles in California. Charles, what's up? Hey, Dave. Hey, Brian. How are you guys doing today? Hey, very good. Good. I just wanted to compliment you guys on doing a real good job. You guys are doing an excellent job on keeping the show going and keeping it interesting and entertaining despite the, the lack of wrestling news that seems to exist. Uh, oh, Brian, I, by the way, I, um, I agree with you. I think um, if the public would have saw something that the likes of Flair Steamboat on that 15 rating, it, it would make a difference on public perception because I know it, mm-hmm. it always did for me. That that's yeah. you know I always looked at the WWF when I was younger as being more cartoonish and the NWA as being more serious. Mm-hmm. Um, quick questions. Actually, I have three questions, Dave. Um, the first one is for you. Um, I was watching a Freebirds compilation tape, and it the beginning of the tape was extremely old. I, I can't ex- I can't date it exactly. It may be somewhere between seventy eight and eighty, but I think it's um, the first time Michael Hayes breaks up from the team. And in the promo he cuts, he attributes it to Ole Anderson, and I was wondering if you knew the story on what happened with that. Uh, is this like a shoot a shoot interview? No, it's not a shoot interview at all. It's okay. this is I mean, I don't, TV, I don't, TV uh, promo, TV okay, storyline. I, I, okay, TV storyline. I remember when um, maybe Ole Anderson started team with Terry Gordy. I mean, I remember the Freebirds splitting in Atlanta, God, probably like 1980, I'm guessing. This, this tape um, is probably that you know, old. And, and they did the, you know, and they did the feud in Atlanta, and then they got back together in Alabama like a year later. Um, but I don't, I don't remember what the storyline was, other than they, you know, Hayes and Gordy turned on each other, and I don't even remember where, where Buddy fit in, if Buddy was even around. I just remember a Michael Hayes Terry Gordy feud for a while in Atlanta because they had that that stupid baby bonnet match. Yeah. It's, it's the weirdest thing. I'm trying to, because I, I didn't know the story on I'm trying to find somebody who Gordon, doesn't Gordon know exactly ended up teaming with, You know what? Terry Gordy ended up teaming with Jimmy Snuka against Michael Hayes and Otis is Strunk and Michael Hayes and Kevin Von Erich. Yeah. Now, that's, so so it, was, it was something with Snuka, somehow. Yeah. In the promo, he attributes it to Ole Anderson, though, and evidently there was some match that happened with, with the, the Freebirds and the Anderson brothers where the Andersons went over or something, but... It made Hayes look like a goof and, and caused the breakup of the team. But I don't know exactly what happened. I'm trying to track down the story. I don't. I don't. Rem- I don't remember that exactly. That may have been. I, I would have been watching it then, though. But I don't because I remember the Freebirds breakup. So, but okay. I just, for some reason, I don't remember it. Okay. Uh, secondly, uh, this is concerning. I was listening to you guys earlier, and uh, you guys made an excellent point with uh, how you can link some of these stories to you know something that may be newsworthy and still pretty sensitive in the public eye. So I was wondering um, if WWFE is part of their creative team, do they have people that are specifically in charge of keeping track of national news stories and even local news stories for the places and the arenas that they're going to play to know which stories they can actually capitalize on and which ones they should stay far away from? I don't think so. 
I've never heard of I don't think someone has that job, but they always seem to know. Like, you know, whenever someone's... Whenever they do well, a I mean, promo, they, like, Kurt Angle always knows what the hell's going on in the town and everything like that. So right. well, then they may have so someone who's... get, like, knows. a newspaper and look through it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, I know just that Jim Ross used to, like, you know, I mean, because remember they're on the road every day. That, you know, Jim Ross would just go through USA Today and look, look at the, um, you know, and, 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 you know, just remember, like, what city they're going to and kind of, you know, throw in... You know, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And uh, la- lastly, um, concerning the Austin turn, um, I'm I'm noticing, and maybe it's just me, but there are still certain things that he does that still kind of indicate babyface. And I know from when he stands know, in the corner and raises his hand, he's yeah, begging and, people and to the cheer drinking, still, yeah. And, and the biggest one to me, Dave, is still when you hear that breaking and entering, which goes all the way back to the Brian Pillman angle where he broke into Pillman's house and beat him up, and Brian had the nine millimeter. That, that breaking glass, to me, that psychologically tells the fans, pop, pop, baby face pop. And it seems like you have to take some of those things away and then preserve them. And he starts to reintroduce them gradually with Vince McMahon objecting as he starts to turn face again. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Interesting. But you're right, the yeah, breaking glass. He needs to get rid of that uh, celebration before the match. I mean, why? Why does he do it? Yeah, the because everyone, expects, except everyone wants to take a picture of him? Yeah, the, the entire I Conquer thing. I mean, those are the types of things we used to look at that Hall and Nash would do when they were supposed to be heels, but, you know, they were still getting over his faces. Yeah, and continuing to do them when they were told not to, remember? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, that, that's about it for me today, guys. Thank you very much for taking my call. I'm really enjoying the show, and just keep doing the good work. Thanks very much. Okay, guys. Thanks. Bye-bye. Okay, we'll go to Chris in Boston. Chris, what's up? How you doing? Uh, Dave, I was uh, actually at Raw last night in Boston, and uh, just have one question. There was actually a couple of things that I was actually curious about, but uh, why why does the WWF technically always use, like, like for example, at the beginning of the program, instead of doing a promo, they decide to do, like, the whole SmackDown interview with Jim Ross and Stone Cold. I mean, that just, the arena was just constantly booing the whole thing. And that took about 20 minutes. You figured it, you know, cut it into... To certain you know points, but uh, they never did that. I mean, do you find that being a, a constant occurrence as far as like? Uh, oh, it's very rare. Yeah, it's very rare they do. They've only done They've it, been doing it a lot lately, though. They did they it. I mean, they, they did. We were just. It started after Kurt Angle. It was about literally about fifteen to twenty minutes, and that was the most horrific thing because people were getting up, leaving, like you know, not leaving the arena, but you know, getting something to eat. I'm like, you know, it was just it was just a waste of time. But here's one question I was wondering. When Kurt Angle came out, uh, they made reference to a couple of Red Sox players. Did they mm-hmm. say at all during the TV, or did they show it, that Johnny Ruiz was just sitting right next to them? I didn't hear his name mentioned. I just saw Tim Wakefield. Tim Wakefield, yeah. but yeah, cause We were just wondering about that, because Johnny Ruiz was right next to him, sitting down. and all, I'll tell you the honest truth, the biggest pop out of the night was out of him. Uh, hmm. the, the moment he came into the arena, they keep on, you know, they kept on just popping him and popping him, and like during like uh, certain matches, uh, they were just constantly going to Ruiz and just n- totally avoiding like uh, matches like Benoit and Jericho and and things like that, which was kind of amazing. So I figured maybe they would make any kind of reference to him because you know noticing that there was people going towards him. I don't remember the mention in his name. Yeah, he was right there through the whole thing. Um, and why can't they do something like if they're gonna have a twenty-minute segment that they know is gonna be something? You know, they should, they should have like a, why don't they put a match a, in the ring? Have a match in the building? Yeah, but you know, but they want the fans in the building. They think that the the interview segment's more important. The thing is, I mean, like I, I was think, Okay, I was thinking about this about seventy-five minutes into that show, and I'm going like, you know, I'm really glad that I didn't pay like thirty-five dollars for this one. <laughs> we we were really, I, w- I would feel real bad about you know because it was like. You know, you, when you pay for a wrestling show, contrary to what a lot of people think, I think most people actually want to see some wrestling matches and during that time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, where, where we were, we had we had some decent seats. And now, you know, you're sitting there, you're waiting for your typical, like, you know, Triple H, like, you know, 20-minute promo. I'd rather have that, you know what I mean, as opposed to watching, you know, something. At least I mean, the guy's right there in front of you. Exactly. It was just a completely waste of time. But here's one last question I wanted to ask you about uh, last night. Being at the whole Linda McMahon thing with, you know, her wanting a divorce, was that the original angle that they were planning, or was there supposed to be a Shawn Michaels slash McFoley type of surprise? Uh, I, 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 don't, I don't know that they ha- 
<laughs> I don't know if they ever have original things. Because yeah, I was like, because you know, it's, it's like going week by week. On, let's I think see, I think it's kind of like, like the, you know, we're going to do this. Well, I mean, I think that this thing where she comes back and asks for a divorce. Yeah, they probably had that planned some time back. But it's like, okay, now how do we get out of it? They may not have planned that. Because I keep thinking of like the. Uh, you know, when they first did the uh, Stephanie McMahon Triple H wedding, I'm sure that they didn't have them, you know, the idea that they were going to be married for the next 15 years right. on TV. I think they just, you know, they just got there, and then all of a sudden it's like, well, golly, neither of them could actually break up with the other one. But, yeah, I want <laughs> nobody's to allowed to dump. No one's allowed to dump the other one. And when they started that Kurt Angle thing, obviously they must have had a better idea how to get out of it than they did because they got nothing. <laughs> that was really yep. bad. I want to make one last note from the last call of what he had mentioned about Stone Cold, you know, getting, you know, the pops that he's getting. The thing is that the funny thing is right when, you know, uh, Raw went off the air, this guy did everything that you could possibly imagine to get heat from people. Like he went to Jim Ross and tried to, you know, he flipped his hat. He would go to Lillian Garcia, you know, uh, supposedly, you know, give her the finger or whatever, poor Bill. Everything the guy was doing, every single thing he was getting a pop at, and uh, you know, you know, trying to play with the crowd, try to gain some heat that way. So the last thing I just was wondering was like, if this continues, but being that the Rock is out at the you know at the moment, I mean, will they be forced to bring him back as a face, or can they can they keep him heel long enough before Rock actually gets back and they do a payoff, or will it be like WCW yeah. when they set up this big angle and by the time the guy comes back, they've already turned the guy six times and the angle's dead? Yeah, I don't know. I hope I, I hope they can at least have you know Rock come back with Austin and um, at least I mean I, I'm sure that they won't I'm sure they won't turn because they, they're going to turn Helmsley so they got all this stuff lined up for Austin for they months have to and be, months if so it I is, think they're pretty much committed if it is an Undertaker you know, if, if it is that they bring Undertaker to a uh, to a main event status it just seems to me I don't know maybe in, in your eyes it's, it's a little bit different but it it seems like with, when they've teamed with the, the uh, Undertaker with Kane. It seems too much that you know they've made the Undertaker more of a mid card type of wrestler now. You know, I mean, I don't know if, if I'm you know. Yeah, you they can still bring they can still bring him back though. He's got enough credibility. I mean, it's the thing with Undertaker and Austin that I don't like is if you remember going back whatever it was a, a couple of years ago, it seemed like they main evented on every pay per view, and it was so many main and events. And matches got worse and worse. Yeah. And matches got worse. And, and when I it was over, it was, yeah, when it was over. It was one of those things where, like, all, like you know how some feuds like Flair and Steamboat, whenever they would come back to it, you kind of get excited. This is one where it's like, I never want to see him again. I don't care how hard, how, how well they mix it up or shoot a new angle. It's like I've seen every Austin Undertaker match that I ever want to see for an entire lifetime. Yeah, it was pretty bad. But anyway, I think I let you guys go. But I wanted just to kind of get that point across from like the interior part of of the uh, of the arena that time. But it was just, I mean, just to make a. You know, my point clear, it just seems like it, it, McMahon's got to really, really do something to the Austin angle because they tried to do it last night, and there was, like, so much stuff being thrown into the ring last night. I don't know if you got to see that on TV. Uh, I think it started, like, after the TV went off. But yeah, I didn't Triple H got pegged up yeah. the head about two or three times. Stone Cold did, um, where it seemed like they got, you know, legitimately pissed off the crowd. But they kept, they kept them standing there. But it was just right when the arena heard that it was going to be a six-man tag, and they heard, you know, Stone Cold, Triple H, and Stephanie. And once they heard Hardy Boys, all you heard out of the arena was some cheers, some pops, but a lot of sighs. So, I don't know. Hopefully they can just kind of up the ante a little bit next week. So, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Okay, thank you very much. And we are totally out of time. We'll be back tomorrow at 5 with Carl Elliott Stern. E-yada now.